2022. Please rise if you're able and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I ask that you remain standing and join us in a moment of silence. Um, we traditionally do these moments of silence as we keep uh, the men and women of our military in our thoughts and prayers. But I, I also would uh, like to add a couple other things. One, we just uh, remembered September 11th just a couple days ago, two days ago. It was just a uh, horrific event that seemed like only yesterday, but are now 21 years behind us. Though. For those who lost loved ones, it probably still feels like it was just in the recent past. And, and of course, you know, it was over 3,000 people killed on September 11th, and, and one of them was the brother of our own town attorney, Jim Burke. Uh, his brother, Billy Burke, was one of the firefighters who raced in there to save lives and unfortunately was not able to uh, make it out. So. Um, also, we, we've had a recent death of somebody close to uh, one, of, one of our uh, close associates, uh, Kim Otati, our deputy clerk's father, passed away last week. And uh, Kim, our, our condolences uh, are with you in any way we can support you with that. He, um, he also, um, Ro Robert Gregor is his name. You may recognize the name Gregor. So he's the brother, half-brother of Alex Gregor, our former highway superintendent as well. And I'll just say a couple things um, as we remember him. He was born in Southampton Hospital in 1944, um, graduated Hampton Bays High School, and then went on to join the U.S. Navy in uh, 1962, the year I was born, um, and served for another six years during the Vietnam War era. Um, as a patrol squadron. Uh, he worked for Grumman uh, Defense Company when he came back and also North Sea Well Drilling and volunteered in the Hampton Bay's Fire Department. He's also an avid fisherman, loved the waters uh, particularly around Hampton Bay's and Shinnecock and uh, he will be remembered there, right? There's going to be a uh, memorial service the family is planning for a burial at sea and uh, we don't have the date yet but we will announce it. So those who want to support the family and remember uh, Mr. Gregor, uh, Robert Gregor, they called him Buddha, is that was his sort of nickname? The commercial fisher yeah. family. So Kim, our, our thoughts in person with you and, and your family, and let's join together again with all those things in mind for a moment of silence. Thank you. Please be seated. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Supervisor Schneiderman. Present. Councilwoman McNamara. Present. Councilman Martell. Present. Councilman Bouye. Here. Councilman Schiavone. Present. All right. We are all present, um, and we will begin the meeting. So the first order of business I will make a motion to approve the minutes of our regular town board meeting of August 23rd, 2022. Second. Seconded by Councilman Bouvier. All in favor? Aye. 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 Approved. Next, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of our special town board meeting of September 1st, 2022. Second. Uh, seconded by Council Minsky voting. And um, let's... Uh, do communications and then we'll add the, the ads on. Did I do all in favor on this? Not yet. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Approved. Okay, uh, let's move on to communications and then we'll do the add ons. The following communications have been received in my office of the town clerk. We have received public notices from the New York State Urban Development Corporation doing business as Empire State Development. For the Shinnecock Commercial Dock Rehabilitation Project at 333 Dune Road in Hampton Bays. Town of Riverhead Notice of Adoption. Town of Southhold Public Hearing Notices. 
Village of Sag Harbor from the Board of Trustee, a lead agency on a proposed Verizon telecommunications facility in the Village of Sag Harbor. Board of Historical Preservation and Architectural Review for a location at 59 Howard Street, again in the Village of Sag Harbor. Village of Southampton Zoning Board of Appeals application and financial disclosure statements filings from the listed individuals. We've also received emails, letters, and land use applications regarding the following. Hampton Bay's Civic Association meeting of August 29th, 2022. Contract language with Nelson, Pope, and Voorhees. Planning board matter of battery energy storage systems in Hampton Bay's. And a planning board application uh, for Lewis Road, uh, number 89. The following bid and request for proposal was received an RFP for professional surveying and engineering services for Noyak Road pedestrian enhancements. And that concludes the communications for this meeting's agenda. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, I would like to add four resolutions to our agenda. You will find them in the attachment. Um, they are walk-on resolutions. This requires four out of five of us to uh, vote in favor of adding these to the agenda. Uh, 41270 is our 17th warrant. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 41273 authorizes the supervisor to execute a computer use agreement with Len Leonard Marchese, MBA CPA, in furtherance of professional services consulting contract. Uh, 41284 recalls and amends uh, resolution 2022 26, set town board work session schedule for 2022. And lastly, 41286 ratifies memorandum agreement and authorizes the supervisor to execute, <coughs> I'm sorry, a PBA agreement. All right, can I get it? I'll Second. make a motion to walk those four on. Seconded by Councilman Martell. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so those will be added to our agenda at the end. Okay. All right, so next up will be uh, public hearings. We do have um, a number of public hearings, total of five that we'll be uh, having today. We asked if you plan on speaking at a public hearing to fill out one of these cards. They are located in the hall. Um, typically, once I get through the cards, um, I will ask if there's anyone who has not spoken. We also are... Um, running this as a hybrid meeting so on the screen to my left to your right we have uh, um, the ability to bring in people who are watching from home or their offices on the internet and so after we have um, heard from the public here we will then go to the public there if so if there are um, speakers so we uh, we ask everybody to keep their comments to no more than three minutes the clerk will typically let you know when you're approaching your last 30 seconds. Okay, um, Madam Clerk, would you read the first public hearing notice? Public hearing number one, to consider the acquisition of land at 1040 Flanders Road, Flanders, and amend the CPF project plan and the management stewardship plan to include the property. Okay, and Jackie Fenlin yes. from our CPF department will introduce us. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Supervisor and town council members. Nice to see you all. Um, so public hearing agenda number one is the property right here. So this is 1040 Flanders Road in Flanders. Um, so you can see that it contains wetlands and is fronting on Reeves Bay, as well as um, frontage on Flanders Road. So this is on like the east or northeast side of Flanders Road. The property owner uh, is 1040F LLC. And this is a 4.5 acre parcel um, located Suffolk County tax map number 900-145-51. Um, and this is for um, to increase the opportunity for open space, and it also is slated as a wetland preservation target area. Uh, we also own the property um, right over here, which is a birdie property, and then later in the uh, afternoon, we will also be considering the public hearing for this property right here, which is 1140. Um, so this is significant for wetland preservation. It does have contain existing structures, as you can see on the aerial as well. Um, one of those is notably this house right here, um, also known as Methodist Point. Um, so we are looking at the historical structures on site, um, noting the in, uh, historical um, integrity of the main house, which is here. You guys might know it. It has like the American flag kind of painted on the side as you're approaching from Flanders Road. 
Um, so I'm here if you have any other questions. What is the purchase the price? It is um, two million three hundred and forty six thousand. And how many acres? This is four point five acres of waterfront. Now, are these two being offered as one or? I know we're holding separate hearings, but can we buy one without the other? Or it's uh, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think they're just time similarly and similar. Uh, it's same owners. Yeah, same similar. Owners, two yeah. separate contracts. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And do they have the same address? Yeah, they, they do not. Top so top this is 1040, the one that's oh, a little bit you. further north. Got so that it. one has the existing structures, mm -hmm. and then this one's the second hearing, which ha contains the old um, gym. An aquatic center, also previously known as Seven Z's. And center. 1040, that's contiguous to a very large piece of property yes. that is that is currently. Yes. Uh, so this was previously um, preserved. I think right. it was in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. But this is uh, basically the larger portion of the original duck farm uh, that was already preserved. So yes, it's important to note that this will be adjacent to that existing preserved property. So okay. the big duck, where is it on there? The big duck is right, right here. There. Okay. So that's like that large assemblage, those historic structures and visiting area. And then this has an independent driveway to pull in to basically um, access the house and the remaining barns, et cetera. OK. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you, Jackie. All right. So we're going to go to the public, those who wish to be heard on public hearing number one. And we're going to look through the cards. <laughs> Sorry, I don't see any number ones yet. All right, I don't see anybody for num public hearing number one. Is there anyone who came here to speak at public hearing number one on this property acquisition? Um, okay. Seeing none. I have some All right, uh, Charles, you want to bring that individual on? Yeah. Well, he well they let him in. Um, there was a letter also. The Flanders Historical Society did want to be here, but there's a letter being circulated for you as well. Okay, we can see you. I don't know if we can hear you, Lori. Is that me? Yep. Yep. You're Lorraine. How are you doing? Hi, Lorraine. Good afternoon, everybody. I just wanted to, I'm Lorraine Vesselio from the Bayview Pines Civic Association, and I just wanted to add our support to the purchase of both properties that are on for the public hearing, uh, which you just spoke about, 1040, and I think it's, which is Methodist, Point and the other one is seven Z's, and um, that's it. Okay, thank you, Lori. Thank, thank you. Thanks, um, Jackie. Just a quick question. You're going to be up there in a second anyway, but um, if you could come over, is this acquisition slated as a historic acquisition or open space acquisition or both? Uh, I believe this is open space, but we're still evaluating the historic uh, relevance of the properties. Um, notably, we would like to see if it can be saved, the main house. Um, and then there's other several structures that have to be analyzed. So we might, yeah. Yeah. rather than holding a separate public hearing, if we're going to do it partially as a historic res uh, preservation, we might want to amend the public hearing notice to include that. Okay. It could be done later, but... I'm just thinking be rather do it sooner than later. You can mm -hmm. you can make it both historic and open space. And yeah. Give us some options. Yeah, right. that I mean that would be fine to give options further on. Okay. In which case we might want to leave this open. Okay. All right. Um, again, anyone from the audience who wanted to speak on this? Okay. Um, I I'll make a motion to adjourn it so we can investigate whether it should also be a historic acquisition and not just an open space acquisition. Is, is that, are the board amenable to that? Yeah, I, I understand that Landmarks Board is looking at that. If I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm not, if I'm incorrect, I apologize. But I, I think that's a good solution. I, I know it has some, some real basis in the history of Flanders. And if we can preserve it as part of the open space, I certainly agree with that. Yes. Um, yeah. When, Sunday, when is our next meeting? 
Your next meeting should meeting. be the 27th, a 6 p.m. meeting, September 27th. Yeah, and we did conduct a site visit at the property on Friday. Um, and there's definitely some elements that show, um, you know, that this property has historic so we, significance in the If we take a little more time, we don't, the purchases will not be in jeopardy because yeah. we've missed on this a couple times before. Yeah, I, I did want to make that point that I know this is very, you know, we really want to see this. Yeah, I'll have to Sorry. follow up with the sellers. Oh, oh. The yeah, and, yeah, and I think that comes first. Mm -hmm. I, I think the designation is certainly part of the consideration, but mm -hmm. it, it, if there is an issue. Procedurally, Jim, I mean, could we walk on a resolution today to notice it for the, a public hearing on, on the 27th to consider it for both historic and open space? Uh, we, we could do that or just, or we could just amend it. Can we, or, yeah, how do we procedurally get it? Do we have to do a whole new resolution? Because then I'm thinking we won't be able to vote on it next meeting either. Right. We, sh we need to notice it two weeks in advance. Right. So if we were to walk on a resolution with a new public hearing notice that's both historic and open space, we mm -hmm. could potentially solve it. Sure, uh, yeah, we can do that. I mean, could you do that conditionally? Could we purchase conditionally with a review of his, will that, would that affect? A yeah, I mean, I can check also. I mean, in the meantime, I'll check to see how, how um, you know, urgent you know, with, with the sellers, um, the matter is. I know Lisa worked very hard on this, uh, this one and, and the next one to try to preserve these very important properties. But, yeah, I mean, we uh, could amend the, we, we could amend the CPF project plan later mm -hmm. and make this historic, I mm -hmm. think, but we'd have to have a new public hearing on it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's. Um, I do know presently we are waiting on the survey as well. We probably have some time. We probably have some time. Yeah, probably. we are we waiting on time. the In which case, survey. why don't we adjourn it to September 27th, right. but why don't, during the course of the meeting, if it's possible to get another walk-on right. that would notice a, a For both. Whole public hearing as a historic and open space acquisition. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'll make a motion, at least for now, to uh, adjourn the public hearing to September 27th. And second by Councilman Bouvier, I believe. Sure. <laughs> or, or did you second before? I thought I, you did. I didn't, but I'm, I'm happy to. <laughs> okay. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right, Madam Clerk, would you read the second public hearing notice? Public hearing number two, to consider the acquisition of land at 1140 Flanders Road, Flanders, and to amend the CPF management stewardship plan to include the property. All right, thank you, Sunday. Um, Jackie Fenlon will again introduce us. Yes, good afternoon again. Um, so this is the property, this is a 3.1 acre parcel of land. So this is um, the uh, property which housed the previous pool and athletic club. Um, so you can see it right here. There's also a zoom in right here. Um, so you can see um, this property, uh, the building is in disrepair. So this would be demolished. There's no historic significance here. Um, this is currently owned by Island Properties and Associates LLC at 1140 Flanders Road. And this is Suffolk County Tax Code number 900-168-7. Um, one dash seven, sorry. And this is um, being considered for $1,147,000. How big is it? This is 3.1 acres. 3.1 acres. It looks so thin, but it actually goes back. Yeah, so if you, when you just see it from the street, you feel like it stops, but it actually goes back and goes has significant long, wetland. Yeah. What was the price of you? 1,147,000. Does that include the current owner demolishing the building or no? I believe we're responsible for the demolition. We are? Yeah. And the idea would be then to open up the view? Yeah. To the, yeah. I guess, Reeves Bay over there? Yeah, we're thinking, um, you know, preliminary plans were for a small parking area and a viewing platform so that everything's clear and, uh, you know, enjoy that expansive view of Reeves Bay. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? No, I just, uh, I'm really glad to see this happen. Yeah. It's been so, yeah. so long. A long time. I, yeah. I actually taught diving there in high school, so I, I remember it well. I actually personally took swim lessons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and had a birthday party there, so yeah. It's not a historic <laughs> property. Yeah. It's not historic. You know, I'm yes. not that old. <laughs> <laughs> now, as liaison to Flanders and John before May, 
uh, we could speak that the community really wanted to clean up the eyesore and have a view shed that they could be proud of. So this is something that they certainly uh, are all for. So I appreciate the work. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. So let's go to the public. I didn't see any cards on this one. Any, is there anyone here wishing to be heard at this second public hearing? All right. Seeing none. Uh, Charles, anyone? We already heard from Lorraine. She made comments on this as well before. I don't think she needs to come back in. Um, I see no hands. All right. Now I will make a motion to this one we can close. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Seconded by Councilman Martell. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. The third public hearing notice. Sunday. Public hearing number three for enforcement action at 42 Argon Road East, Hampton Bays, New York. Suffolk County tax map number 900-2643-20. Property cleanup and hazard abatement. Okay, Sean Cambridge, Assistant Town Attorney will present. Good afternoon, Supervisor and members of the Town Board. Uh, this is what it sounds like. This is an enforcement action. Uh, when I introduced this, I had mentioned this is ProChamps um, working. That's the vendor we'd engage with when we passed Section 262 of our code, which identifies zombie homes. Um, so this home, has been problematic for quite some time. Um, we've only recently started to have progress um, once we noticed this public hearing. Uh, so we sent out a notice. The bank um, promptly got somebody out there and started cleaning up the front yard. As you can see, there's dumpsters. Um, the side and rear yards are still in pretty atrocious condition. There are construction materials, windows, general debris, uh, broken furniture, all sorts of things like this that are an attractive nuisance. Um, still at this location. I'd ask the town board to authorize a cleanup action. Um, resolution 2022-946 is calendar today. We could always hold that in abeyance um, for the actual work date. If this bank continues to make progress, um, I would recommend a 30-day period. Um, otherwise, we should go in and clean this up and levy it to the homeowner's tax bill. Okay, thank you. Any questions thank from you. Mr. Cambridge? Sean, they did a halfway decent job on the front. They looked like they pushed a lot of material to the side and rear yard on it. There's still a smell coming out of there. It's still, you know, the neighbors are still complaining, so we have to keep a close eye on it. That's my understanding as well. So it's been like this for approximately a year. Yeah. Um, once we sent that notice of public hearing resolution notice to the owner, um, they rolled out these dumpsters and started cleaning, but it's far from where we'd like to see it. Right. Well, I'm glad we're doing it. I'm glad the legislation works, too. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sean. All right. Anyone from the public on this third public hearing notice for the property cleanup? All right. I see no one. Uh, Charles, anyone online? I see no one. Okay. I'll make a motion to close. Second. Second by Councilman Martel. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, um, Madam Clerk, the fourth public hearing notice. Public hearing number four, to consider wastewater treatment, aquatic habitat restoration, and non-point source abatement projects proposed for 2022 Community Preservation Fund, 20% water quality improvement plan funding. All right, before we get into this, uh, Jim, I, I know the fifth public hearing I have a lot of cards for, and I know that the applicant has asked to adjourn it to an evening meeting, I think, or That's by about a month. Yep. And I, I, I don't necessarily, the next here, this fourth hearing is probably going to take an hour. So um, who, who is here to speak at the fifth public hearing? Just raise your hand if you're here to speak at the fifth public he hearing. So maybe what we can do is take it out of order and adjourn it. And it does mean you'll have to come back, but it might be better than waiting an hour just to be heard, knowing that you're going to have other opportunities to speak. Are you guys amenable to that? Oh, okay, no, we will definitely open the hearing and take comments. We want to hear it now instead of later. I'm just saying, but I, we know that it's going to have a public hearing. What's the date? October 25th. Uh, October 25th, which is at night. So if if you don't mind waiting an hour, we will. you can take your comments there. You won't have to come back in on October 25th. But if you wanted, I would take it out of order so that we could just adjourn it 
to the 25th, and then you come back on that date. But I'm, I'm happy to go either way. If, you, if you're here and you want to speak, but uh, be prepared that the hearing before it is probably going to take an hour. If you want to go stretch or grab a cup of coffee or something like that, you can, you can do that. Okay, so we, we read the public hearing notice. Um, so what are we doing? Yeah. So Sorry. what we're, we're going to do the fourth public hearing. And then we will do the fifth public hearing, do take the comments that are here, and then we'll adjourn You all understand it. that that means that you're going to have to wait an hour or more to speak. Okay. Yes. Okay. We were going to... Okay. And you'll also have another opportunity to speak on October 20... 25th. 25th. Okay. All right. Um, so who is presenting? Jackie, are you presenting? All right. Jackie Fenlon is going to present on the wastewater grant program. Not wastewater grant, the uh, water quality grant program. Yes. Uh, thank you. So this is the second round of water quality grant applications that were being heard. Uh, the previous round uh, we heard on August 23rd. So I just wanted to remind the board uh, that we did start this process in February. We released the grant application and opened this uh, 2022 round. We accepted applications until April 18th. Um, the Water Quality Advisory Committee worked very hard, so I want to um, let you know that Stephanie Davis, the chair, is here today. And thank you to Stephanie um, and also Chris Clapp, Anthony Graves, Andrew Brosnan, and Will Peckman, uh, who is our newest member. And we did receive a total of 19 applications this year. So it does <coughs> seem like we're getting more and more applications each year, and it's a very successful program so far. Um, we did uh, already hear about the stormwater applications. There was four in total of those. Wastewater treatment, we have seven in total. We are hearing the last um, wastewater treatment um, today, which is the Sag Harbor Village, Sewer Shed K and L. So that will be the first one on here. So this is. This one right here. Um, then we'll be moving on to aquatic habitat restoration. Um, we did hear Meacox Bay Inlet um, because of the funding. Uh, that was considered by that on August 23rd. So we already handled that one for aquatic habitat restoration, but we will be dealing with Lake Ag <coughs> Harving, harvesting, uh, which is this one right here. Old Town Pond dredging, which is this one right here. And then Sagaponic, Sagaponic Pond aquatic habitat restoration, which is this one right here. Um, and then the rain gardens at Emma Ellison Park, um, which is actually right here. Sorry, it was a little out of order. Um, and then next we'll be moving on to non-point source abatement. There's three of those. So that's the Lake Aguam injection well, um, which that is right here. And then the Poxabog Pond uh, groundwater seepage. So this will be for a study of Poxabog Pond. And then moving finally to West Main Street Bioswale, which um, you're all probably familiar, but that's the internal um, Main, West Main Street parking lot in the interior of Southampton Village right here. Um, so, you know, without any other further questions, uh, we recommended, um, and we'll, we have 16 million, let's see here, I'll get the exact amount, $16,259,076. Um, so we are currently recommending around $12 million in funding for all of the So you're going to go through each one? Uh, no, we should have applicants here to present okay. each application on behalf of the Okay, so which is the first one we're doing? The village? So that would be the village, yeah. Sewer oh, Shed K. Okay, and is there somebody here to present on yes. the village? And your, your flashlight is on. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Supervisor and Town Board. I am Trustee Aiden Korish, Village of Sag Harbor. Um, I'm the liaison to the sewage treatment plant. And I've been working on this project with the village and various uh, consultants for the last three or four years. This board was kind enough to um, fund 50% of a sewer master plan that we worked on over a number of years. As we developed that plan, we identified two areas of um, immediate need in the village. Uh, one was designated Area K, which exists uh, <coughs> within the town of Southampton. And the other is Area L, most of which exists in the town of East Hampton, but a small portion, seven homes, exist in the town of Southampton. Um, moving on from that, we identified we had excess capacity at the sewage treatment plant in the village. We're very fortunate to have a plant. Um, we can handle 250,000 gallons a day. Summertime in our peak season, we're <coughs> running about 150,000 through there. So we identified 100,000 gallons a day of excess capacity that we could use to sewer some of the um, more difficult homes in the village that are close to the water within a high water table area 
and uh, some which may well have failing septic systems. Um, all of these homes are unsuitable uh, for uh, IA systems due to the high water table and the size of the properties. And so the most efficient uh, way that we can reduce nitrogen entering our local waters is to sewer them. Currently, the sewage treatment plant is licensed at eight parts per million of nitrogen uh, output. Um, IA system would do 19 uh, mil, uh, parts per million. And uh, the sewage treatment plant tends to put out three to five parts per million. So it's a good plant. It's older technology, but it's run very well and puts out a really good product. Um, we identified within Area K uh, 44 parcels um, altogether, and we identified seven parcels within Area L that fall within the town of Southampton. They're on the west side of Division Street. <laughs> Uh, this board was also kind enough and the, and the CPF Water Quality Committee, whom we owe a big debt of gratitude for supporting these projects up to now, funded engineering, uh, all the engineering work needed to develop a plan that we could then uh, put some dollar, dollar amounts to uh, for connecting all these homes. Um, that plan was developed, it was complete, and now we're at a position where we are ready to start sewering. Unfortunately, sewering is enormously expensive, and so the town has been looking at many sources of revenue. Uh, we've applied here for $3.591,318,000 to uh, execute this project. We understand that's a lot of money, um, but we think we can put it to really good use. If the town board um, saw the way to funding this completely, we could start this project. It is as close to shovel ready as you can imagine. We've identified the homes, we've contacted the homeowners. We have been into every home and investigated because the nature of Sag Harbor, every house is different. There's all sorts of obstacles in every law in, 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 in on every property. So we have visited every home. Uh, we've surveyed all the streets. And this amount also includes the uh, right of way work in the street up to the property line and also connecting the properties because we feel that there's no point in doing this and putting a burden on the homeowners that they may not be able to afford. So which really would, would um, would undermine uh, the uh, effic efficacy of the entire project. Um, on this side of the village, we're looking at putting in what we, what's known as a low-pressure system because it's a very low-lying area. So every house would need to have um, a condenser pump that would eject the uh, material into the, into the gravity main, and it would flow down to the sewage treatment plant then. Um, we are ready to go on this um, if we were to get all the funding. If we don't, then we'll go to New York State, to the DEC, and use this as the local match um, to get the funding there. That would postpone everything by at least a year because the next round of applications would be in December, or sorry, in July of next year with the results in December of next year. We have applied this year to the DEC. Um, because we hate to see any cycle go by without getting an application in. Obviously, we couldn't say that we had a local match at the time, so I don't hold out much hope for this year's application, but they're aware of the project. Um, that's it in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer any questions. There's so much detail here, I could go on forever. Um, there's hundreds of pages, so, and I won't. Um, so, it I, so it's not only the, the main, but it's also the connections? The it's also the connections to the homes. It's also, it's going right up to the building. Um, Everything within the house would be on the homeowner, but we want to take it to some of these yards or side yards, front yards, and there's all sorts of, so this is broken down. The, the, um, the right of way would be 1,288,815. The connections is 1,562,818, and that's in area K. Over in area L, the right of way would be 600,780, and the parcel connections would be 138. It's slightly different on those area L because it's gravity fed. So there's two different systems going on here, mm -hmm. even though it's under the one application. Would the homeowners be responsible for abandoning their existing system? Yes. Okay. That the, the existing systems would need to be abandoned in compliance with Suffolk County Health Department. Um, so a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Um, one is this is shared between East Hampton and South Hampton as, as well as a project. Do I understand that to be correct? Yeah. Is East Hampton may be able to provide matching funds? Well, East Hampton we've applied to separately. So what we have here is um, Area K. There's two areas we identified in the village, Area K and Area L, that are in need of immediate remediation. Area K lies wholly within the town of Southampton. 
area L, which is east of Division Street, and given the nature, once you run the pipe down the street, the homeowners uh, that it passes are obliged to connect. There are seven homes on Division Street that in doing the area L, East Hampton portion, we would, would be obliged to connect, but those seven homes are west of Division Street, so they lie in the town of Southampton. So it, it, just to follow up on that, so you have, you have either made the attempt or are attempting to get cr uh, grants from the, the DEC, East Hampton, and uh, New York State DEC, this fund for these total costs. It just kind of reminds me a little of the West Hampton Beach project. Yes. So I'm, I'm trying to understand, are you creating a sewer district? Is there we already have a sewer district. So yeah, the entire village is the district. What we're actually doing is extending service areas. So we have just widening your... We're well, widening the, the catchment area. There is, um, if anybody's, I'm sure you're all familiar with Sac Harbor, if you're west of Main Street behind Scavone's, Rose mm -hmm. Street, Meadow, Bridge Street, the water table there is pretty much at street level. Um, and it's well within the one to two year travel time. Oh, it's absolutely within the one to two year. Um, tonight we'll be presenting uh, the, our uh, monthly trustees meeting the, the, uh, sewer, the, um, the master plan that deals with the entire village. And the reason we pulled these two areas out, it became really obvious as we started working on this plan that these two, uh, these two neighborhoods were in absolute need of um, of remediation that um, it's hard to know how some of these septics are working at all because they're literally sitting in no, the groundwater. No, no, we've, we've had those discussions yeah. over time with, with the uh, county and in regard to those accepted IA systems that you know, basically sit in water and what's accepted and what's not. So, right. But I do know that the county is undertaking some efforts to, to uh, um, help with that um, but so far I haven't seen any pro problem well we did get that. awarded uh, to uh, about two weeks ago two hundred and fifty thousand okay, dollars from so the county um, that we're splitting between L and K and will the village will be matching that okay all right um, so well we I, it's a it's a good project on uh, for all the reasons that you stated so I, I defer to our our water quality board that's what they're set up to do is to make decisions uh, or recommendations to us on that basis but uh, this is a good project and I support it thank you I can tell the board that uh, coming from a plumbing family of three generations that a lot of the homes in this area are on antiquated systems that have almost no treatment as far as sewage right. and they're very close to uh, the bay and the travel times as well so I'm really happy that the village is going at this the way you are um, and I also appreciate the fact that you are going after other monies through a variety of, of, of municipalities quite challenging being split between two towns it is for, for the and we seem to be chasing inflation every time we start one of these projects it seems to be a, um, a sign curve that we just can't you know try and catch up with it with the funding required I have some questions Aiden. yes so is it only residential properties in this K area or their commercial ones as well? um, K is all uh, K residential okay here we go land use K residential there are 29 properties non-residential that are 10 uh, so the 44 homes in the K section. So how did you get to 44 homes? There's 44 parcels. There are... Or 44 parcels. So some are commercial. Uh, yes, some are commercial. And I don't have a breakdown of that, but I can get that for you. And... I'm not sure if we have a general... The commercial, I'm just trying to parse this out a little bit mm. because once they're on sewage treatment, some of those commercial properties now may be able to change uses. Maybe they'll be able to go to a, a one that has a higher flow. Um, our CPF funds aren't supposed to be growth inducing. They're supposed to handle current um, flow. Yes. A and in the scenario that you've painted, uh, property owners are paying nothing, right? The, the They'll be paying, well, they will pay for the, for the use and the maintenance. Yeah, the They'll operation be, and maintenance. The operation and maintenance. Structure, they're, they're not paying anything. And I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. I know if Jennifer from Messiano is on uh, remote She's access. Watching. Yeah, we can bring her in. But she so may uh, have more detail on this than I do. She worked so, on that. So, yeah. and abandoning their system is not part of this. Excuse me, Jay. That that was my point. I just point want to finish my train of thought here. Yeah. I'm sorry, Councilman. Um, so, that's an expense. The the on a per parcel basis, the town grant being requested is around forty five thousand nine hundred. Roughly Correct. per property, which is more than we would typically do for an IA system. An IA system 
Right. We provide, I think, what, 22,000? Yeah. Well, what we provide uh, uh, can up to a maximum, but uh, yeah. we found that homeowners actually have to, may in some cases, extend the cost. But in combination <laughs> with the county right. program, um, that pretty much is. Yeah. Uh, so it's about double the request. About 31,000. Yeah. But we're also talking about 100 year, county, yeah. we're talking about 100 year infrastructure. The current infrastructure in the village is put in the 70s and still operates just fine. We're also talking about the homeowner contributing on an annual basis for the rent. There'll be a sewer rent on the uh, infrastructure and there'll be use rent. It's basically charged from Suffolk County Water Authority billing. So, so it's water so in So like water the out. example of a homeowner will give a 20 or $22,000 grant. The county might give 11,000. Right. The homeowner sometimes pays some. So here this is, sounds like it's predominantly, if not 100%, town requests to fund each parcel. And I'm just trying to assess the bang for the buck. It's mm -hmm. um, it's a great project. I think everybody yeah. should be sewered in that area. Yeah. Um, it would be easier for me to stomach it if I knew that there were contributions in other directions, whether they're federal or state or county right. or local. Um, and we're the low-hanging fruit. We have this grant program where it's easy to come to us and ask for full funding. Um, but it doesn't allow us to leverage our money very well. Right. That's why we have applied to the DEC, because they'll do a three-to-one match. So for every dollar we get here, we can go to the DEC and ask for another three. So we're, what they look for is a 25% local match. So that, the number that's being requested from us... That's the full amount. That's but the full amount. Yes. But you're hoping that we only have to pay a third of this? We are, but it all depends on what the DEC come back to. So... Um, we're in a sort of a difficult situation when it comes to funding projects like this yeah. because we don't know what the DEC we're going to say down the road. Um, I don't the know DEC, how if the DEC sees that the town is fully funding it, why why wouldn't they say, well, yeah, you don't need our money? But the, but well, the, I just but the full but amount is ten point four. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So they're asking us for you're asking us for the local map. Well, yes. Sorry, the three point nine. The full oh, amount so is ten point. Yeah, oh, bigger okay. part. Yeah, yeah. I did not understand yeah. that. We're asking for the local match, Yeah. So you are looking for just the local match. A, just the local third, match. A third of the. Uh, yeah. oh, yes. Local. Just the okay. two. All right. Million that's yeah. Something. That's helpful. So sorry, I was. I, I no, even though it is the number yeah. is correct. It's about forty six thousand a parcel. Yeah. But the actual cost per parcel is three times that. It's three times that. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Aiden, how many coverage areas are there in the village as per the engineering? Uh, there are probably 16, 16 different areas. I have some, let me see here. Uh, roughly, okay, and this, yeah. is, this is one. Yeah, and these are closest, I know it's very hard to see this, but these are right down by the water. One, Area L is very close to the sewage treatment plant, and area, it's, it's that area around Rysom Street, mm -hmm. and Area K is, um, is behind Scavoni's, it's Meadow, Rose, Bay Street, that, uh, uh, Long Island Avenue, that whole area there. Um, it's very low lying. Um, and we, when we developed the master plan, we, we, we uh, Cameron Engineering came up with a methodology for creating a hierarchy of which, was the most, which are the most polluting neighborhoods, depending on the type of soil, the, the distance to groundwater, and the distance from the shoreline. And also the size of the properties, because the certain property sizes are not big enough to take, some of the very small properties are not big enough to take a, a, an AI system. Any other questions? Or IA system. So how confident are you if you get the local match for this year, mm -hmm. if the DEC doesn't grant you the funds and it goes into next year, will you then have the funding to apply with the local match for what you need? Well, we've already applied to the DEC, but we couldn't take the box to say that the local match was assured. Okay. Well, we did say that the local match had been applied for because we had applied for it uh, in, in time. So we'll wait to see what the DEC comes back with, um, and then we'll see, you know, we're really, you know, at their mercy as to what happens here. So if you were to fund this portion of it and the DEC doesn't come through, then that leaves us in a position where we have to go look for more funding. How far along is that process to where you can go back to, could you go back to them and say that you... We might be able to go back and amend our, our existing application. The, the, um, they will deliver their decisions in December, okay. and our, our uh, application was in in July. 
as I say again, if Jen Messiano is on, if she's able to weigh in on that, she knows the ins and outs of all this grant writing. But just with the costs going up, it kind of Well, it's just it's chasing, yeah. like, even since we started this process, the cost has gone okay. up substantially. Well, there's a, a lot of moving parts. There, I totally it's, understand. Yeah, it's trying to you sort of Other nail. districts so, have gone through the same, yeah. same problem. So I just, uh, we have so many of these things. We could bring Jen in if, we, if you feel that that's critical at this juncture. Um, I think uh, I don't think it's necessary to speak with you're asking for basically a third of the funding yes and so our funding would be contingent on you receiving the other right otherwise there's no project to execute okay. yeah all right yeah so all right thank you um, so it, so this grant I, would be contingent on the DEC well the problem is with saying I, that to the DEC I can't really tell the DEC that my application because now we're into sort of a circular argument here that both each right. grant is dependent on the other, the other grant. Right. Uh, um, it, the difficult thing with these projects, I think, w w w is that they are so big and they're so expensive that they're outside of the normal range of projects dealt with by CPF for the water quality aspects anyway. And they're depending on multiple sources. So somebody has to go first. I mean, I don't know if there's an opportunity that if the, if the grant was approved, um, but if the DC, if there was a time frame on it that if we couldn't get other funding within a certain period, that I, I have no idea what the construct of the grant is, the legal aspects of it. But at some stage, someone's got to go first, or else, <laughs> the, or else the whole thing just comes to an end. Comes right. to right. so and that should be us. So uh, it, it is what I mean. According, in speaking with Fred, he really believes. Fred, Mr. Thiel, excuse me. Um, he really believes that local, like the CPF, is here to provide a local match so that we can leverage state funds for these bigger projects. Right. That and, and that's similar to West Hampton with some of the ancillary um, areas that want to avail themselves of, of the system. Mm -hmm. And it, it's curtailed by the flow rates of whatever system th that's going to be provided to them. Sure. Um, but, you know, to, to the supervisor's point, uh, the object here is, to, is not to induce growth. Uh, that's a real critical right. thing on the floor. And I think this is a way that that has some steps to make sure that that does not mm -hmm. happen. I understand that. Right, so but it's time consuming. Yeah. I I, I, there's also, sorry. No, I'd just like to move it along. It's okay. just because we have a lot to cover. And sure. I think we've covered this. I, I have to ask if there's somebody, is there anyone else speaking on behalf or against? Not that I'm aware of. We right. seem to is be, there, we've had no opposition. Anyone here who wishes to be heard just on this one project in Sag Harbor, the KNL? areas all right i don't see anyone um uh same is true online is there anyone online charles mm -hmm. jo what on this on krl on sag harbor I think so. <laughs> I guess we'll, find out. we'll see <laughs> it's probably jim Jackie, while we wait, what is the next one you'll be covering? It is Lake Agdon. Okay. That's number 12 in our... Can, can we maybe do all the village... If we could identify S Southampton them. Village has a several of them. Can we do them in a row? So we can let the mayor go home? Or? I'm going to stay for number five. Anyway, okay. But if we can consolidate it, if that's your preference. Yep, that's done. All right. Um, Jay, don't go away. I don't think we need to. All right, so. Is Jen with you? She worked on all of her grant applications. She worked on this application. Hi, Jen. If you need to hear from her, I She's here now. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that uh, in all the conversation, you, you ended up not needing me, so I won't delay um, the hearings. Appreciate it. Yeah, we have so much to cover. I'll, I'll hang on for the Southampton Village ones. I've worked on a few of those, so but I'll, I'll mainly be in the background. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. All right, Aiden, you can sit. Thank you. All right. Thank um, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, which we're doing uh, Lake Aguam next? Uh, so if you want to hear all the village ones together, there's Lake Aguam Algae Harvesting Phase 1, uh, which is this one right here for $5,363. And six hundred dollars. Then there's the old pound, old town pond dredging, which is here That's for four point fourteen in our packets. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it should go in order with the recommendation memo because this is like well, the second half. Well, you have Mecox so Bay 13, which we yes, did it, already. Yes, I was just going to yeah. say exclude Mecox Bay because we already heard that at the August 20th. So it's just those two in the village? Uh, no, sorry. There's two more. Uh, Lake Aguam Injection Well, which is right here. Okay. And then we also have the West Main Street Bios Well, which is this one. 17 for the injection well. Okay. Are you guys okay with doing all the village ones in a row? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, who's uh, presenting on behalf of the village? Myself, we have uh, Dr. Vogler. Uh, each application is going to have a different uh, presenter because there are different uh, engineers working on Okay, so. Um, so, I guess we can go in order with Lake Aguam algae harvesting. All right, so let's do Lake Aguam algae harvesting. Who speak, who's introducing that one? I'll, I'll go up and maybe, I'll go up and introduce, and then I'll, uh, I have, uh, we have Dr. Vogler uh, here as well, and then for uh, AECOM we have Dan Levy, uh, as well as uh, some of his team of engineers. So, okay. if it's okay with you, I'll I'll get going with this application. So the first application. Well, I'm just, I know who you are, but for our audience. All right, for the for the audience, uh, uh, Mayor Jesse Warren, Southampton Village, uh, 23 uh, Main Street, Six Potato Field Court. Uh, there's a number of applications here in front of uh, uh, this afternoon's uh, WQIP, you know, CPF grant applications. Uh, many of this is three years worth of work uh, and came to fruition after a number uh, of studies that we've conducted, including a, a village-wide uh, watershed uh, uh, study done by Nelson Boatman Voris that, that you guys obviously helped with as well. Uh, the first one on our agenda today is the Lake Aguam algae harvesting application. Uh, this, uh, and we have Dan Levy from AECOM who's here today as well as his team, AECOM is the leading engineer on this in the United States. This project uh, began in 2019 through a pilot program with uh, at the, at the governor at the time and the Office of General Services. I know, Jay, you were, you were there as well as the town board and as well as the town trustees. Uh, we never gave up on this project and since then we've explored actually expanding uh, a pilot program uh, up to uh, processing two to three million gallons of, uh, of, of water per day. So what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to turn this over uh, to Dan Levy, who is uh, uh, on Zoom with his team. So we'll get Dan up here. But uh, this project, in my opinion, uh, is instrumental for cleaning Lake Aguam immediately. Uh, Dan will, will talk to you about the whole process here, about how we're essentially extracting lake water uh, and basically turning that lake water into, into clean water. Again, the, the results from the pilot program will be demonstrated. You'll see that there was a 90 plus percent reduction in nitrogen and phosphorus. Better if the engineers do it, but what I'll also follow up with some supplemental materials is that we have letters of support uh, from the, uh, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. We have letters of support for this application from New York State Assemblyperson Fred Thiel, uh, members of the Suffolk County Legislature, uh, the Cornell Cooperative Extension, possibly even one run from you, Supervisor Schneiderman, as well. But uh, I, will, I will turn this over to Dan Levy. And then also we have uh, Dr. Gobler here as well, who can uh, back up any of the, uh, the findings. So uh, hopefully we can get Dan up here. And Dan, I know there's a, it's probably a, more of a limited uh, amount of time, so you might want to just kind of review this to some of the findings from the pilot program, where you might set this up and how this might work. Sure, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, can everybody uh, see the slides and hear me? Yes. I'm Dan Levy. I'm the director of our uh, algae program at AECOM. Uh, I will just go through a couple of slides uh, real quick and we can go into any detail if anybody wants, but I know we have limited time. Um, we're just going to go through the technology, the laboratory results, and then the implementation. The technology uh, is using a flotation system. It's a hydronucleation system that we tested, as uh, the mayor pointed out, uh, uh, several years ago at Southampton. Uh, the process was proven effective. Uh, we have since been working throughout the country um, uh, using this system to mitigate harmful algal blooms. We do believe it's the best system for Lake Aguam. Uh, here's a uh, quick photograph of, uh, you can see how the water, when you see the jars up on the right side of the screen, influent versus affluent, and then the jar uh, with all the gunk in it is the algae that comes out. So this is a, a, a physical process where we remove intact cellular algae, and in doing so we take out the nitrogen and phosphorus. 
in the process. Here's the layout for Lake Ogawam. Uh, as the mayor pointed out, we're gonna have a three MGD system. These will be linked in together. Uh, the footprint itself will be approximately 140 by 120 feet. Uh, and this could be placed anywhere around the lake. Uh, we're looking at the Dorshire property, I believe, as the, uh, as the number one site. With this, the laboratory results, uh, when we were out here during the pilot test, uh, you can see on the percent uh, over to the right side of the screen, this is what we took out of the lake. Uh, we essentially removed 99% of the microcystin uh, and the high 90s uh, for the chlorophyll, phosphorus, and nitrogen. And again, as I pointed out, this is a nutrient export system. Uh, when you compare that um, to what we'd be doing at the lake, uh, we looked at the existing loads that come in, both on nitrogen and phosphorus, and using a three MGD or three million gallon a day system, we would essentially uh, re remove about 52% of the nitrogen load that's coming in, and about 23% of the phosphorus load that's coming in. And you can see how that would be relative to the, uh, the stormwater treatment uh, program that is going to be implemented there. So this will have a little bit more of an impact uh, on the lake than, than the actual treatment plant itself. Implementation, um, we're going to have uh, a quick picture of how this would look. We'll have about a just under a mile long pipeline that would be placed uh, along the bottom of the lake. We'll have a diffuser system. This will allow us to bring in the clean process water to uh, uh, support the system as we continue to extract the water uh, from the north side of the lake. Uh, this is just another graphic view of the uh, skimmers. They'll be placed on the north side of the lake. We would extract water from the north and discharge in the south. Uh, this is an, uh, just a rendering of how that would look uh, uh, placed into the lake, we'll be using sandbags. Uh, we gave a presentation about a, uh, a month or two ago to the trustees that has been approved on the permitting side to allow us to use this method to place the pipe into the ground or on top of the surface in this case. So I'll stop it there and we have plenty more information or slides to get into any detail or questions that this uh, panel would have. Uh, I have a couple questions. That pipe you just showed, is that the intake or is that the uh, effluent? That would be the effluent. That is the discharge pipe. Okay, so your, your intake is at the surface, right? Correct. The intake will be very close to the park on the north. It'll go up a little bit to this slide. Um, it'll be up, uh, if you can see the cursor, that's just on the uh, edge of that park. Uh, we'll have surface skimmers that will be extracting the water. Uh, the system uh, uses the discharge water, which is going to be clean, clarified water uh, to uh, support the system. That will essentially push the plume uh, towards the north. And the, the, the money that's being requested, which is over $5 million, is that purchasing the equipment, or is this is just a contract? You guys own the equipment and operate it? or? Is it uh, something that it's a one-time purchase? This is uh, this would be for the purchase, but the this would be some of the money needed for the installation and hard assets. But yes, the uh, plan is for the village to own the harvesters, own the assets, and then we will do the first year operation and maintenance. And then if if a desire is there, we could then train local staff to operate the system with some oversight uh, from our organization as we go forward because this will need to run on a continuous basis. So now are there, that site that you're selecting, um, which is a CPF acquisition, the Dosher Park, which has had different ideas proposed for it uh, over the years, but it wasn't purchased as a water quality um, parcel, it could be converted to water quality, but I think that would require an act of the state legislature. Um, it, are there other sites that are under consideration? I would uh, I'd defer that over to the mayor. 
Can I ask you on the technical side, are there sounds associated, smells associated, or is there public impact from the operation of this and uh, the utility costs for operating it? Is that something that also the village is covering? Uh, we assume the village would be covering the uh, electrical costs that would go there. Uh, we haven't gone to that level of detail yet, but that would be a, a understanding. Uh, the odor, we we're going to have these things sealed, so essentially there will not be an odor. We'll keep a, a negative pressure um, on the unit uh, backside. And for the noise, you will have some pumps uh, very similar to a pool pump. Uh, these would be a little bit bigger, uh, but we could be putting in uh, barriers to, to limit that even further. All right. It's very, it's like very close to a playground there, too. So. A lot of people use that, a lot of children in that area, so um, just want to be mindful of what the impacts may be to the community. But uh, Mayor Warren, did you want to address the Dozier location? That's right. So the Dozier parcel is, is the best parcel, but uh, we do not need the whole parcel. Uh, as, as you know, uh, we are working with our state assembly person, Fred Thiel. Uh, we've contracted with NPV to do the meets and bounds for the survey, uh, and our state assembly person, Fred Thiel, uh, had uh, let us know that he would likely be putting this into uh, state law to alienate the parcel. This goes uh, uh, hand in hand with another acquisition that we're making, and that would be the ideal situation. Plus, obviously, alienating that parcel for water quality would be a monumental achievement because then we could also potentially do other things in the future there as well. However, uh, we do not need the entire dozer parcel if needed. Uh, there is some village property that's adjacent. Uh, so uh, regardless of whether we can use dozer, the dozer parcel or not, there's adjacent property that we could also use. But we're uh, very optimistic that this will go into the state legislature and be an, an active act uh, of that body. Is it an alienation or is it a conversion to a water quality parcel? An alienation, I think, would require that a public referendum on CPF, whereas I think the conversion from one allowable CPF use to the water quality use from open space might just require a legislative act at the from Albany and a town board resolution, not necessarily a public vote. So it's just something to be mindful of. All right, thank you for uh, for sharing that. Uh, well, we can we can ask Assemblyman Thiel, who's the right. expert on that in that area. Absolutely. Um, so. And so you, you're going to give us how much of Dozier you would need for this? Uh, we so estimate uh, about 120 feet by 140 feet, approximately about one-third acre. And how big is the Dozier property? Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head, but it's definitely larger than that. This would be a, a small section of the Dozier property. Dozier's probably about an acre, maybe less, so it could be a third of Dozier. We could look it up. But. It could also serve as an educational experience uh, for uh, residents and students alike who uh, are interested in, um, in uh, water quality. I know the South End High School has got a great marine biology class, and I, I went over there to speak to them about, about this exact same uh, project, and I know they were, uh, the marine biology class was very interested. In fact, they're actually growing uh, algae over there as well. Um, in, of the projects that you're requesting, is this the most important one to the village? This this project, there there's several other important projects here. It's it's very difficult to rank, but what I would say is that this project uh, gives the village and the the town the best chance to have a clean Lake Aguam over the next uh, year, two, or three. Uh, there is nothing else that could be done at this time um, other than stopping inputs and then dredging, which is a much larger project to reduce the phosphorus, simply because there is a 20-year a uh, legacy load in the watershed. Uh, and until we have a, a sewer and until we eliminate that legacy load for 20 years, uh, we're going to be stuck with a polluted lake for that period of time. Uh, this is bioextraction. Uh, this will have an immediate impact in the reduction uh, of the harmful algae blooms on Lake Agawam. Uh, and what I would say is that, again, this is was piloted in 2019. This will be the first time in, uh, in New York State that we're going to be rolling out this program. So this would be a major achievement for Southampton Town and Southampton Village and for the state of New York. There is a one uh, MGD uh, uh, plant or facility in, in Florida, but, but that is the only other, uh, um, you know, that's the largest one that in this country uh, to date. The other thing that I think is important to share with this board as well as the public is that we were, uh, got extremely good news. 
Um, this, is, this project is going to cost more than $5.3 million, uh, but we were working very closely uh, with our United States Congressperson and Senator. <coughs> uh, I got a call uh, less than a month ago from our, our Congressperson who actually told me that there's a federal earmark for uh, the remaining uh, uh, portion, if not, not some extra, uh, in, in the House Appropriations Bill. It's already passed the House, and if it's signed into law by the Senate, uh, and, signed in, and then, I'm sorry, passed through the Senate and signed into law by the President, the village of Southampton and the town will be getting a $5 million earmark to go with this. So we'll have all the money that we need to actually put this program into place. So I, I think it also speaks volumes that this project actually was passed by the, by the House uh, of Representatives, um, given the importance of this and how so it's much actually they, a $10 million project. If we scale up uh, to, uh, to, to three, uh, it's, it's upwards of a $9 million project. Uh, we applied here for less uh, because we were unaware that we were going to be receiving uh, that, uh, that grant. Uh, we still don't know if we're going to get that grant, but it's, we're, we're cautiously optimistic that it's available. But I think so it's the important. the $5 to million covers one filter or th two filters? What is it? No, I, I think if you want to do it in a very simple term, uh, because of the infrastructure, we're estimating about $3 million per MGD. So for three units, it's a $9 million. For two units, it'd be $6 million, et cetera. But you have operating costs, at least as the committee's noting them in their review, of approximately $2 million a year on top of that. No, the operating costs are, are going to be less, less than that. Uh, some of that was, uh, I'm not sure where that number came from, but they're going to be significantly less. That three million gallons per day, was that based on one filter or three filters or two filters? The three million gallons a day is based on three units. So it's a million gallons a day per unit. That is correct. And can you put that into context for me? Um, yeah, if you look at the lake itself, the lake holds uh, roughly about 200 million gallons of water. Uh, we would essentially, if we run three harvesters uh, continuously, we would remove three million gallons of dirty water and return three million gallons of clean water. So by the end of a month, we would have about 90 million or about half the lake of, half the lake volume of clean water. So as we continue to do this, it's going to be uh, mixing, we'll have ongoing sources and you have everything else that goes with the lake but you can kind of get a sense of three million gallons is a lot of water. And we can continually run these systems. Now these are not gonna be run during the winter months. These will be run uh, early spring and out until late fall. Uh, then they'll be winterized and then we'll start up again the following year. Uh, California just purchased the first harvester. I'm currently in Cincinnati now. We're working with the governor and his team on deploying harvesters here. As the mayor pointed out, we have them in Florida and then New York State, et cetera. So uh, this was developed uh, as a team effort between our organization, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, ERDIC, universities, et cetera. So this is the best and greatest process right now to mitigate harmful alga blooms, which, as everybody knows, is becoming more and more challenging uh, as, as we see throughout the country. Uh, these things are becoming a little bit more toxic and a little bit more problematic. Uh, so that's why this process, the one we demonstrated here several years ago, uh, is cutting edge, and now we're going into actual application. All right. um, Mayor, well, I mean, what's challenging for me is you have a, a lot of efforts to clean Lake Agua, and this has a high capital cost for the equipment. We've talked about PRBs, we've talked about village sewer systems, and if some of those other things happen, you may not need this filtration system, um, or vice versa, if this filtration system works, you may not need some of those other things, so, though there are other purposes, obviously, to sewer systems. Um, and if we spend $5 million on this infrastructure and it's no longer needed, because of those other things, the algae levels now, water's clean. Now you're sitting on a $5 million piece of equipment, which, or it, I guess you could surplus it and return the, the funds back to the CPF program or something that paid for it. But uh, it, it, it's cre you have these competing projects. And 
uh, you know, any one of them could work, a combination could work, but they could also make other projects um, unnecessary. I, w I would agree with you. In 20 years, we might not need uh, this algae skimmer. And, uh, and in 2042, uh, uh, maybe I'll call up uh, uh, Meacox, uh, the tri town trustees, and we'll donate this to Meacox or, little, Meacox or Little Fresh or Big Fresh Pond. Uh, but for right now, uh, until we get those various projects in gear, uh, this gives us the best chance. But I would also, again, argue that various projects do different things. So for example, we'll be asking for uh, funding for phase four of a permanent reactive barrier. That PRB uh, uh, prevents uh, nitrogen loading in the groundwater from getting into the lake, uh, making the, the job of the harvester easier. The bioswales that have been funded and that we continue to, uh, to plan and design, again, uh, you know, uh, stop you know, non-point source pollution and road runoff from getting into the lake. Uh, dredging, which is you know, the most extraordinarily expensive project, that targets the, uh, the phosphorus uh, as well. So it's a different, different type of uh, pollution there. So uh, we're not going to gonna, gonna obviously clean a lake that's been polluted for decades that's, you know, listed as one of the top polluted lakes in the country uh, just uh, by uh, planting a bioswale. Um, you know, we're going to have to take uh, large, large action here. And the good news is that uh, this project uh, likely, you know, knock on wood, will have significant federal funding as well. Uh, so it's not just the, uh, the town and village dollars uh, at work. I'm also happy to uh, you know, turn, uh, take any questions to Dr. Gobler as well, who might be able to answer, uh, put this into the overall. So the request the that's in front of us for the five plus million is, is not a match, right? You're not saying that's contingent on another five million coming in. So that you're saying that would fully fund or largely fund, except for the village has operational costs. Um, that would purchase the equipment set up the equipment and get this thing up and running we will we would need this is not going to fully fund the project uh the village or it would fully fund one one but we would at a minimum we'd want to scale up to two because based upon our analysis uh one is not going to give us the uh the the uh, achievement that we need so at a minimum we'll need to do two based upon the numbers that the engineers at aecom have uh have calculated and so there there's definitely a village matching component to this whether that money comes from the village or whether it comes from the federal government remains to be seen, uh, but this cannot be done with just a town uh, CPF WQIP dollars. So I hope that helps. Uh. So to match, if you're doing two, which was a $6 million cost, you would really only need about $3 million from us to match it, not $5 million. That sounds about uh, correct. I'd turn that over to, uh, to Dan, though, over at AECOM. Okay. Just a, a point of clarification, since Jen, um, when we submitted the application, the proposal was for the two MGD system at a total cost of, um, I believe, a little over six million, and the village had offered a matching share of twenty percent um, on those capital costs. So the village's outlay would be that twenty percent plus the ongoing operating. Okay. Thank you, Jen. So I'm, I'm going to echo a little bit of what the supervisor said. We have a big town here, and you guys have a lot of asks. Um, and I think it's important if, to clarify what, it, what an earmark is from the federal government, what that actually means. Is it project directed? Or I think there's a lot of questions here. Um, and clearly, I personally feel I've got a lot of homework to do in order to understand this. Our, our uh, uh, water quality committee has made certain recommendations and has made some comments to us that, that I won't share now, but uh, I think there's a lot to look he here, but I'm also concerned that we have a finite amount of money, that we have a lot of projects across the town that we need to consider. Um, so this is just part of it. Um, for some of the reasons that uh, Mr. Schneiderman went into, um, you know, you have a, a lot of things in front of this that could do this job, and we're, it's kind of a gamble in a way, not completely, but I understand your philosophy here. But at some point, we have to also consider everything else that's going on in the town and the amount of money that we have that, as I said before, is finite, and we have some projects that deal with very large water bodies uh, and some very serious issues that we want to make sure happen. So I need to get with you Stephanie and try to understand this a little bit better before I, I can opine on that. Thank you. 
And if I could offer, we'll be more than happy to uh, schedule time to provide a briefing in more detail on the technical aspects of why this is going to be the, the, the right tool for the lake. Um, I'm not sure this is the right form, but I'll be more than happy to uh, address or go into any detail or any questions that anybody might have. Well, I, I appreciate that. I know you presented to the to our water quality board. Have you not, or not? We presented okay, to so the maybe. trustee. Yeah, we've yeah. we've given uh, several presentations, but I think that the the biggest takeaway, and I'll, I'll be short about it, is when you're looking at doing sewer projects, uh, as the mayor pointed out, there's legacy loads. Uh, we've done those in several uh, cities and counties around the country. They usually take several years if not a decade to get implemented and then from there there's usually another decade to get the legacy loads out uh, as the mayor pointed out because harmful algal blooms are so prevalent in lake Agawam, there is a potential for these things to get more toxic there's also not really positive news on the aerosolization issues that are becoming more and more prevalent now so uh, our recommendation, and this is why we're working with the national governments, et cetera, is to find ways to mitigate harmful alga blooms. And Lake Agawam happens to be a relatively small contained body of water, and this will be the best approach to mitigate that. Uh, and again, I'll be more than happy to spend the right amount of time uh, to answer any questions or to set up a separate presentation uh, so we can get into details of it, but it is an important issue. Water quality, as we're seeing around the country, is becoming uh, more of a threat than a lot of people understand or, or could appreciate. So we'd like to sh the opportunity to uh, spend the, the appropriate amount of time to present this information. And I appreciate what you're saying, and I'll also say that this board is quite well versed on water quality and understands the implications that you're talking about. So, um, okay. Should Thank we you. hear from Dr. Gobler this year? Chris, did you want to? I think Dr. Goldberg can probably wrap this up and then we're happy to keep on moving. The other thing, uh, uh, Councilman Abuvi, that I'd say is that when I first started here, you know, the village was doing a few, a few nice steps, but not, not a whole lot. So I, I made it the village's mission and my own personal mission to make sure that we did everything to address water quality, which is why today you're seeing so many applications. You know, this is three years worth of work. No, I appreciate you know? that. <laughs> so. But you know, as I said, there's, there's this much and yeah. there's this much want, and we have to balance that. So that's the only point I'm trying to make. Yeah, we, we would watch the village of West Hampton come up here and, and, and bring home the dollars for their, their sewer. And I would call Mayor Moore, i say, Mayor Moore, Good for you. You beat us again, and and I said we're not. It's not going to happen this time. So that's why we're here. It's not a competition. No. All right, Doctor Doctor Goldberg. Uh, good afternoon, Chris Goldberg, Stony Brook University, and um, yeah, I won't say much in, in light of the meeting, except that uh, that there's no doubt this the approach is a legitimate bioextraction approach. You know, every time the water is passing through, the the algae are actually creating an opportunity, since they're, they're floating to the surface, to extract nitrogen and phosphorus out of that system. Uh, and if taken away, it's gone forever. And for the phosphorus, that's particularly important because, um, you know, there's no uh, aerosol version of phosphorus. It's stuck. It's been accumulating there for decades, hundreds of years. So, uh, you know, so, that, so it's a legitimate um, method for bioextraction. And if it keeps going, if it's done for a sustained at a sustained level for a very long period of time, it's gonna to start to chip away at that total load. Um, I, scientifically, I don't think it's gonna prevent a bloom in the first year. Uh, the algae just are gonna outgrow the rate at which it's pulling the water out. So I just think that that wouldn't happen. But typically what does happen in Lake Agawam is you'll see a bloom in the uh, late spring, early summer, and then levels are fairly static through the summer. I mean, they're somewhat elevated, but you don't see a lot of growth. And so this system will, through, say, the July and August period, be bringing down those levels every day so, so that in the fall, potentially, then the bloom might be less intense than it would be otherwise. Um, so those are the, the two things that I would, I I would guess say. Just my, my two questions. Do you know what the additive, it, the additive is that causes the algae to coagulate so that it can be filtered out by this means? And is there any impacts environmentally to that additive? 
Well, I know it was approved by the DEC when it was pil on, uh, uh, piloted. I believe it's an aluminum-based. Uh, Hydrochloride, correct. And uh, this has been used. We've been testing it throughout the country. It has passed every test. The EPA has approved it, uh, Army Corps of Engineers. We tested it at Lake Agawam. There's no adverse uh, problems with this. This is also the same chemical that's used in water treatment. Uh, we're putting it in at a part per million. So if you can imagine a million gallons of water, you got a gallon. It's, it's insignificant. The majority of that's taken up uh, in the biomass that's taken out. So as Dr. Gogler pointed out, we are extracting the biomass, the algae, uh, the nitrogen, and the toxins from the water on a continuous basis along with any solutions that are added with that. And again, what we're using is essentially used in water treatment plants. The effluent comes out, it's crystal clear. Uh, it looks better than drinking water. Uh, and that's put back into the water at Lake Agawam. So, uh, you know, I know that this blue-green algae or microcysteine is, is hard to filter in general because it's so small, microcysteine. Um, and so you need very tight filter mesh to, and then a high pressure of water to go through it. But if you add this additive, it coagulates, and then you can use a coarser filter filter media? Is no, we're not, we're not filtering, we're clarifying the water. Uh, we're using a nucleation process where we take the oxygen in the water itself, we pressurize that as we release that, that creates a float blanket with nano bubbles, microscopic bubbles. So you're skimming it off the surface? Is skimming it off the surface, correct. So we don't use filters, it's clarifying. So when you clarify the water, you'll see the murky, cloudy water uh, and we take all the particles out through this process. While we're taking the algae, we'll take out uh, suspended solids or anything else that would be in the water that's part of the process. So by this, by doing this, we're essentially going to clarify the water. So you don't need high pressurized water then? No. All right, so the energy, well, it still would be good to know the energy load so that the village knows what the utility bill is going to be for the months of operation. So they Correct. can at least and, budget and, for it. Yeah, no, and, and we have those numbers, and once we uh, we can provide them in detail, so you'll have an exact uh, kilowatt per hour type of. Cost. Is it is it a three three phase operation or? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a three phase operation. Is that available there, at that location? Uh, if it's not, we can we can create the three you know three phase. These are all um, all workable. Okay, in the. The grid is sufficient in that location to handle the energy demand, right? Yeah, yeah it's, okay. it's not going to be uh, a tax on the uh, electric system itself. And we did look at it. There's not three phase. We can we can create the three phase. Okay. All right. I I, I don't have any other technical questions. So. Um, How long would this system be needed to be in place? Well, it depends on the. Um, the amount of loads that come into that lake, um, and, and Dr. Gobler would probably have a better understanding on that, but the amount of septic tanks, the amount of uh, toilets that are flushed, et cetera, that come into that lake, uh, we would anticipate in the short term these things will be used very, uh, very much uh, to its maximum. And then as the uh, town starts to sewer the system, uh, we would imagine at some point in time the loads would start to drop. But at this point, the amount of loads that come in, nitrogen and phosphorus into that lake, the amount of load that's in the sediment that's coming out uh, into the lake is causing the problem. So we're going to uh, try to outpace that. Uh, but we obviously, the more help we get, the better. The bioswales, everything else that's being offered this is a full court press to mitigate this. Uh, this will be the biggest hammer, the biggest tool in the tool shed, and this will do a heavy lift, but we need everything else around this. And then once we start getting the loads down, the thought is we can then remove uh, or minimize the amount of harvesters there, move them to other places in the town or into, uh, into the surrounding area to mitigate the other lakes that are having the same similar problems. And you mentioned mitigating nitrogen. That is going to mitigate nitrogen that current that would be contained in the algae, not nitrogen suspended in the water. It was just correct. What the correct. algae eats, essentially, you're going to take the algae out, thus taking nitrogen out. 
Okay. Right. I think our preliminary numbers show that we're going to reduce the load by 52 percent uh, with the three harvesters, and that's why we picked that. And that would be a little bit more than what the uh, sewer system three. would do. And 52 uh, percent over what, what time period? Is that one year or is that multi-year? Well, that, that'll be on a year-to-year -year basis. So that's the load coming in each year. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Can I, um, can I just say something before we move into the next one? Because mm. we're over an hour now, and that's two projects. We have six more to go. Um, that's what we were saying. So it's, it's my understanding the developer is not here. There won't be any presentation. They're simply going to ask to adjourn the public hearing until our evening meeting in October. So if, if, you're, if you want to sit through six more of these, you're more than welcome to, to speak. Or you can come back on, it's October 24th, I believe, to our evening. 25th. 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 So there's, we, have 12, we have 12 cards that, there are 12, 12 of you at least that wish to speak at the concern, for in the, uh, the concern project out on 39. So, oh, it's the 25th, I'm sorry. At what time? October 25th at 6 o'clock. I would mm. absolutely hold it over to a daytime meet to the following Yeah, meeting. and so we, you know, it's you certainly can speak today. Um, it's a quandary, it's, you know, the order, unfortunately, is after this hearing, and I, we still have all these other projects. Um, how, how many, let me, let me ask this, maybe there's a way to, we could pause this hearing potentially and just entertain the comments of those who cannot come back at that October meeting, and then we could then adjourn that and then come back into this public hearing. Does that sound good? All right, how many, how many of you are here that cannot come back at that October meeting? Um, there's, there's others outside as well. There's people outside, the there's people on Zoom, that's what I mean, like it's... it's okay, so there, there are at least four that can't be here in October. Um, well, we can. We and can so see. that would be if they each took up three minutes, that would maybe 15 minutes. Can we not say that we're going to have two meetings? The evening meeting on the 25th, and then the following meeting would be a daytime meeting. We will hold the public hearing open on that daytime meeting we, we, for those that can't come to a nighttime meeting. So that would be two weeks beyond the last meeting. I, I don't know because. Supervisor, why don't we just pause what we're doing now and then hear that public so, hearing? So I'm assuming that's going to sort of pause this for about 20 minutes. Um, is that okay to those who are here on the um, water quality grants? Can you take a 20-minute recess? I'm seeing nods. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, let's. Let, this is a little <laughs> unconventional. Let's do this. Why? Why don't we uh, take take a recess on the water quality hearing for roughly 20 minutes? So, um, I'm uh, Charlie Russo from Concern. Can I just briefly address before the, the comment? Public. Just want to. How long? Tell you what? One we get hold, one yet. thing at a time. We're not, We're not there, there yet. Seven <laughs> announcements. We're still in. A, you have a second. So. We'll try. Oops. Yeah, yeah. And here comes the whole. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. I'll, let me make a motion to. Let me make a motion to recess the hearing on the water quality grants. Second. Seconded. By Councilman Schiavone, so we can entertain comments of those who are here today who cannot come back for at the October meeting. All right. Um, seconded by Councilman Scaroni. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So, uh, Madam Clerk, would you read the public hearing notice for the uh, fourth public hearing? Fifth. It for fifth, I'm sorry. Fifth public, public hearing, hearing number five. Combined public hearing for the CEQA draft environmental mm -hmm. impact statement, DEIS, and zone change application entitled Liberty Gardens, FKA, Concern for Independent Living. That proposes a change from R20 to multifamily MF44 and an increase in residential density pursuant to section 330-8 to enable 12 units per acre in order to construct a 60 unit supported housing development that is 100% affordable in the hamlet of Tuckahoe. 
All right, thank you, Cindy. And Jim, we had received correspondence from the applicant requesting an adjournment to a different date, but we had already noticed it for today, so we, right. we had to at least open the hearing and then adjourn it to a different date. That is correct. Okay. Um, but there are people who came today, and we're here to, to hear from you, but we will be absolutely adjourning this to October 20 25th. 25th, which is an evening meeting. So we're really, you know, we'll, we'll hear from the applicant whose attorney is here just very briefly. Um, and then only those people who cannot come back, won't be in town or whatever reason on the 25th. And we will also on the 25th allow people to come in via Zoom as well. So we're gonna do this accommodation best we can. So sir, please identify yourself um, and please keep your comments brief. Yeah, I have just three very short comments. Charles Russo. 400 Town Line Road, Hop Hog, New York, for the applicant concern for independent living. Um, just we we uh, respectfully requested the adjournment because we were getting notification from people that were upset that they couldn't testify at night. So we contacted. Couldn't testify uh, at, at, during the day. They they couldn't uh, attend during the day and would like a night meeting. So we 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 spoke with the town attorney's office made the request um, so we made the request as an accommodation and um, it's fine that we hear today but we're not making any presentation the second thing is is that we've been also getting communications for uh, you know and rumor that we are proposing again egress and and, uh, and ingress on sessions in Hillcrest that's not part of our application so I want to make that very clear that is not part of our application there's no intention of making any any. Uh, what was the first road you said? Sessions? Or you mean seas seasons? summers? Seasons. I meant to or say. Seasons. Yeah. Seasons in Hillcrest. It's the Tap Street, I think. Okay. And we we have no intention, nor is it part. So the application as is does not include any connections. No, there. no. So road connections. So and the third thing is for all of the, with this time period we have, we, we're inviting anybody. Um, to come and visit any of our new sites. Our, our last site just won a Long Island Business Award for uh, the best affordable project uh, in, in Long Island. So we, we welcome anybody, we'll accommodate any time that they'd like to come and, and see any of our projects. Okay. So I thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. So I have a large number of cards, but again, I ask if you can come, we'd like to adjourn this and get back into our water quality thing. Um, hearing, if really these are just for people who, who are here today and cannot be here at the October 25th meeting. So um, I'll, let me go in order and... Uh, if we're opening the public meeting, we, we probably should offer it to anybody who wants to speak. I mean, not to limit it to people who can't. I mean, there are people who took time out of their day. Two well, that, that was sort of the premise by which we recessed it. I understand, it. And right? Yeah. So that we would not, you know, th then we're then we're an hour away from coming back. So, if if the public who are here, I mean, if you insist on speaking, but if you can, I, I if you can come back in October 25th, we ask that you do that. All right. So, uh, Jim. Jim. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear from the audience. So I'm going to start with Elisa Thompson. Are you able to come back, or you need to speak today? Um, I'm not able to come back, but I'd rather take my uh, a few minutes and okay. Okay. Yeah. I have a great sense of kind of uh, yeah. The microphone would like to pick you up. At, we would like to hear you on the mic. Thank you. I need that. <laughs> and there will be there will be a presentation on the 25th, so you should probably come back on the 25th to get to get the most current information. Or watch it. Hi, board. Hi. Thank you for hearing us out. Well, Lisa, you might want to bring that microphone just a little cl uh, down okay. a little bit. Better. Yeah. Better. Anyway, um, my comments. I would rather have Dan Funk talk on my behalf, um, if that's possible, because he has did he fill out a card? No. Yes. No, did he? I thought there saw but, the name. On but he's my neighbor, and I feel like he's more eloquent on this subject than I am. I saw, one of the, I saw that name on one of the cards. Okay, don't do that? Okay. So, anyway, my name's Lisa Thompson. So, reset. My name's Lisa Thompson. I live at 102 Miller Road. Um, I understand the need for um, affordable housing, and I appreciate that. However, on the um, County Road 39, it is impossible to make 
a left-hand turn. Um, and we have an old survey that was done in 2017, 19, um, that shows that that survey, prior to your new survey, shows that there's no way to make a, a left-hand turn on that road. Um, so the only way, so that's my comment. So thank you very much. Okay. 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 Um, again, um, so Elaine, um, Elaine Boss, Bossman? Bachman. Thank you for hearing today. Uh, my name is Elaine Bachman, and I'm a resident of the town for 25 years. And um, I've read this report from Nelson Pope and Voorhees, who state that cars turning Westburn from the proposed 60 units will cross two eastbound lanes into the turning lane, also known as the suicide lane, wait for westbound traffic to clear, and then turn left. I live in a community, as you all know, of 90 homes. That's impossible. The traffic in the morning, not only can we not go left, we can't even go right most mornings. And when we do get in, we have to wiggle our way into that suicide lane. And I have a copy of an accident report from the police from 2008 to 7, 2015. Our corner alone has had 70 accidents from people trying to get in and out on County Road 39. The, um, it states further that there's going to be eight students in this community. How are our school buses going to get in and out safely? They're not. I also have some copies here of updates. Westbound Lang reopens after five car accidents. We all know that this road shuts down often, majorly often. And I've got a report here, cars pulling in from side roads. This is a problem, says Tom Neely, transportation director for Southampton Town. And he goes on and on and he says, multiply that by dozens or hundreds and you get a traffic jam. <laughs> the bottom line is this report is a sham. <laughs> I have wait, I have a study, County Road 39 Corridor Land Use Plan, Town of Southampton, January 15th. Their engineer that this town adopted this, the crossing movements and left turn turn movements onto County 39 are movements that are most hazardous because they require sufficient gap in both the eastbound and westbound traffic in order to safely complete the movement. These are two different engineering reports. So who's correct? The one from seven years ago or the present one submitted by this engineering firm? Obviously there's a problem with this engineering company because we all know what happened? Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. All right. Uh, again, if you can't come back, I uh, no, I understand that. So uh, the same, uh, Renee uh, Mornson. I can come back. Okay. And I will come back. But <laughs> well, since I am here, I will take one minute of the time to make one comment. Okay. Good afternoon, supervisor, members of the board. My name is Renee Morrison. I live in the same neighborhood as Elaine Botman. I'm very, very aware of the traffic, but I'm not gonna comment on that now. I will save that for my return meeting. My one important comment is, this entire project is not for our community. This is a federally funded project open to anyone in the United States. Applicants can come here and they can be picked by a lottery, like Mega Millions, 
like pick five <laughs> over our town employees, our teachers, our nurses, our people who collect the garbage. These are the people who need housing. We are not getting workforce affordable housing. All you're doing is increasing density. Okay. Um, uh, Bernice Lask? Yes. Okay. Take your time, Bernice. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'll just take a minute also because I want to come back to the October 25th. But I lived in affordable housing. Uh, uh, one important thing, very important thing, they never told us that it will end. And when it ended, my rent when I started was 1125. Now, the person that lived there before me under affordable housing was paying half of that. So the rent doubled, and slowly but surely, with the 8% increases, it went to 4000 now, we need to start with some very important questions. How long does this project, this affordable housing project, allow the tenants to stay in their apartments? Is it 10 years? Is it 20? Is it 30? Is it forever? Well, we know, we know that, that federal housing is never forever. There is a time when the real estate interests take over, and that's when they start raising the rent. Well, what happens to these people after afford affordable housing goes? Where do they go? Now, the people that stay, does the government continue to pay their rent? I doubt it. We know nothing about these things. And we certainly don't know what the minimum for the affordable housing is because our teachers, our nurses, our clerks, they probably make more than the minimum affordable housing. So well, um, we, want, we want affordable housing, but we want the proper affordable housing that suits our our local workers. Thank you very Thank you. much. Okay. Um, so next is Lorraine Alston. Again, if you can come back, we ask that you come back. But if you can't come back, then we'll certainly entertain your comments now. Good afternoon. Mr. Snyderman and the board. I want to speak just for a few minutes on the traffic situation. Um, the two ladies spoke of how dangerous it is out on County Road 39, which it is. I've been living in that area for 37 years. It is dangerous. Every single day there's an accident, mostly. Um, what I want to say is that the traffic, the egress that was spoken at a meeting that I came to three years ago, whatever it was, they were speaking about an egress. I heard the gentleman say, that's not in the plans. But with the traffic the way it is on 39, will it ever get in the plans? I think it will be suggested that that happens. I do. Um, he said it's not in the plans, but it will be, I believe, one day. We cannot have any more traffic on Hillcrest. You know, we just can't. Every day, traffic, it's, it's like uh, Grand Central. Uh, traffic, people, some people who live up there, they look like they live in a parking lot. The houses, the cars are all around. There's no room to get up, down, both sides of the street, they're parked. I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> but um, we just can't have an egress into the neighborhood. It just wouldn't work. Um, 
I'm not sure on the first name. Campbell is the last name. Shonda, maybe? Am I saying that? I'm trying to read the handwriting. Uh, Shonda. Uh, yeah, Shonda. I mean, I can come back on the 25th. Um, said, okay. Excuse me, the 25th. But I would just like to say just a couple of things. I've been here. I was born and raised um, in Southampton Village. I've been here all my life. Um, uh, in the Hillcrest area, I grew up there, and I still own a home. I uh, own a home there, and um, we have our uh, Hillcrest uh, community group that me and my husband um, we have we we did before the pandemic, and we have a group that comes together and um, we discuss different things um, in our neighborhood to make it better. And so, um, when we heard about what they were doing about this affordable home um, and then how they want to come through our neighborhood. Um, it really, um, it disgusted me because first of all, we have struggled. I have seen the struggle from drugs and uh, different things that have gone through our neighborhood. And now that we finally got our neighborhood yes. quiet and peaceful, you know, it's still some things that we have to clean up but we do not want any traffic coming, other traffic from any kind of affordable homes through our neighborhood. Right now, if I want to take a walk or if any residents want to take a walk at night, and I mean, you live in a, a, a neighborhood where you can take a walk and you don't have to worry about traffic. We don't want to have to worry about traffic either. We want to be able to walk in peace and live in peace. Thank you. Okay. So, just so everybody's aware, that was a precondition of even the hearing that there was no access through either of those neighborhoods. So, but we wouldn't even be at this point if the proposal contained access. So, no. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, I want to say Daniel Trunk. D Daniel Trunk. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, uh, again, if you can come back on the Yeah, I'm going to say my three things right now, and then I'll be back. Um, to say them again? <laughs> honestly, I can't believe this has uh, gone this far with the uh, resistance. And it seems like w when I question the um, council people, they don't even know the specifics of the plan. So I also don't think it's appropriate um, to change zoning, and I don't think the people on the zoning board should be publicly endorsing this project. And I don't think they should be slinging around, um, you know, name calling people who have their right to, you know, speak up about issues that concern them, especially when these zoning board members, you know, they have their little setup already set up and they talk about nimbyism and yimbyism and I don't think that's appropriate. So getting to the points, the applicant has not shown benefit to the community. Um, the zoning board should be defending the existing zoning until it can be proven that there is some benefit to the community. The obvious traffic reasons that Everybody knows. I mean, I don't even know why you need to hire a tainted consultant to show anything. You all drive around. You all know it. Um, it's not designed to give locals what we need. What we need is the town and the town offices. Maybe you should think about buying the property and developing something that's good for the local people. Uh, you know, you have offices of... Uh, affordable housing and things like that, but maybe I haven't heard about them, but I haven't seen anything come through from that office. I have seen properties for sale sold. None of them have been sold to the town for the development of affordable housing. I mean, you might say, oh, this property is a million. We missed out on it. I mean, the time is now to do something in-house, not to rely on some developer scheme. You guys do it. 
Thank you. We'll see you next meeting. Okay. Uh, uh, Gail Lombardi. I don't know if I'll be dead by the next meeting, so I'm going to take up a couple minutes. Um, I was going to ask for more than three minutes because of my vision loss, but I, will, I was looking through which ones I need to make. I really believe that the town board um, developers must come to this town of Southampton and think they died and went to heaven. They really do. They come, they hear Supervisor Schneiderman and the head of the planning say, we changed the zoning so developers can make money. I could not believe that you actually put that in writing. Are you kidding? So you come along, you have, you know, you have a housing plan that has no teeth in it. You had a housing plan that had inventory, but you didn't finish that housing plan and say, where do we have capacity? Where are we able to build where we're not going to overload a community? And I hear the housing advocates talk about a crisis. Well, I think of the Titanic. Right, people are dying, rolling off the Titanic, and we are the, life, the lifeboat. Well, there's 10 of us in the lifeboat. You put 20 in, we're all going to drown. So you have to look and see where these communities can afford some housing. The developers really, I must think that they do like a Snoopy dance. Yay, we're in the town of Southampton. Um, and affordable housing and house density is like a self, like your, your hamsters in a hamster wheel self-perpetuating the problem. We have more housing, we need more services, we have more housing, we need more. and you constantly move fast. I heard Rick Martell mention it at the last meeting. I think it was one of the budget meetings. He said, all these people moved here uh, organically, and now we need more services. Well, now you're putting more people in, and we need more services, we need more affordable housing. And it's a cycle. You have to break the cycle. You have to figure out what it is we need and where we need it. And if it has to be, and I hate to say this word, moratorium, you may have to think about it. And I'll leave out my other stuff. Thank you. Right. Uh, Joanne Conquest? No, I'll come back on October 25th. Perfect, thank you. All right. Um, all right. Uh, I, I probably will mispronounce this for Rebbe Odell. Am I saying that? Odell looks like the last name? Or maybe Odell is the first name. Odell Ferebe. Ferebe. F-E-R-E-B-E-E. -E -E. Okay. I've been a basically lifetime resident here, coming as an infant. <laughs> And um, there have been so many changes in this small town that has now become more urbanized and uh, foreign to the farmers that used to be here. Um, there are a lot less farmland and more homeland, I suppose. Uh, but within the confines of the village and the town surrounding Southampton Village, it's just a little too congested to peacefully work out all the problems. We have issues with traffic. Uh, I see issues here. I discussed once with... Um, our mayor, uh, Mayor Warren, and I see traffic problems with the county, and I don't see them being addressed. Uh, I know there were state mandates that changed the highways to having a turning lane in the middle of the road. Um, I don't know if that was the best solution. We have areas where it's not clearly posted where uh, a designated turn is going to be, and uh, some signs seem contrary. 
uh, and confusing. And you see it every summer. People come here from the city or other states and they're driving down the road and all of a sudden they've realized they're in the wrong lane. <laughs> you know? Um, we have a regular race every day, several times a day, from the intersection of Bowdoin, is it still Bowdoin Square? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, North Sea Road, and um, going into the village, where it's not clearly marked, except maybe 100 yards from the intersection, that the right-hand turn lane is a right-hand turn lane. And you have people who are going into the village straight ahead. And they get there and they look at you, and the light changes, and it's a race. One day, I think somebody's going to get knocked over into um, Kathleen's Bakery. Um, I said it's Kathleen Tate's. <laughs> um, it's, it's just become a little more dense. And uh, I don't think the density has been addressed. I think it's being uh, amplified and uh, it's creating more problems than the problems are being addressed. And um, for my own community, uh, I think I saw this coming about 20 years ago that I live in one of the most accessible uh, streets to Southampton Village. And uh, now we're going through gentrification. And uh, the property values have risen. People are buying in as much as they can. And I know this isn't necessarily a local uh, created issue. <laughs> when COVID came in, 30 seconds. we got invaded from the West. And um, renting houses became buying houses. And I'm not a realtor, but I understand they have problems finding homes to rent. <laughs> and uh, that's, a, that's a very big statement. Finding homes to rent. You talk about affordable housing. Where is it? Three minutes. All right, um, Odell, that's the, the three minutes. So uh, you're welcome yeah. to come back on the 25th and continue. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, next up is uh, Francis Genovese. Again, if you can come back on the 25th, we ask that you do so. But we are happy to entertain your comments today. I don't know where I'll be on the 25th, and I don't see that I have to uh, meet that condition, which was arbitrarily established a minute ago. Uh, I would like to, uh, to just connect some dots and do a little bit of history here. Uh, when Mr. Fasano first came down the pike, there was a meeting at the Rogers Memorial Library uh, in which he presented his plan and what it uh, evolved to is he was rather stunned that there was any opposition to it. And he felt that if anyone could just see what he built, they would just, you know, uh, on the basis of his assessment of his own work, they would just immediately fall into line and be happy that his project arrived in their neighborhood. Uh, and to substantiate that, he offers the guided tours, which I believe his, his uh, lawyer would just say, has just offered again. Um, this is asking us, as many times before, to accept a proposal based on good faith of the people presenting it. Now, uh, to go back and connect another dot, when there was a public hearing, you, Mr. Schneiderman, said 
Uh, this was about money that might come down from the federal or the state government. We're really going to have to work hard to get people on our side to understand, to, to gain the faith of the people. I think at this point in time, it was even so at that point, but at this point in time, that is not a possibility. We are not going to take anything on faith and based on your good faith or anybody's goodwill. We want a really scientific approach to this. Now, what we see is that this is an inappropriate, let me say, since Mr. Daly is in the audience and before he accuses anyone here of being a racist or a bigot or a NIMBY or a YIMBY, uh, that we do not want to see people who are disadvantaged not have housing. We do not want the housing on a traffic infested road like as it's, as it's presented here. This is, this is an opportunistic bid because a piece of land came up. There's no planning that I can see. I think the statements from the people in Hillcrest verify that there's absolutely no planning behind this. It's just an opportunistic move to increase density. And the other thing is that this is, in effect now, a segmented secret review. Because you are, while talking about wanting to calm traffic, while all of these you know, s statements about the public good in your public outreach, uh, what you actually are doing, talking about wanting to calm traffic, is you are increasing the density and the possibility of more traffic in Tuckahoe daily. For openers, for openers you increased the usages, the special exception uses is on the highway, getting your ducks in a row, so that we could have physical fitness facilities, we could have storage warehouses, you, and, and you also enticed and entertained the pool proposal, which has now morphed into some sort of a convention center with 167 parking spaces. We do not want, and with the Morrow, the Morrow right of way somehow still in place, so he's in play here too. Uh, the thing is, the thing is about all of this is that you can't look at each of these. You can't, we're not going to allow you to simply look at each, to carve it up and look at each of these proposals separately. What you have to do is look at the impact of all of them, the egregious pool, this inappropriate housing place. And also, since Mr. Um, the lawyer, I don't know, the lawyer for Mr. Fasano is here. Could he please enlighten us on the name change? When I questioned what independent meant in concern for independent living, suddenly the name changed to concern. What is, you know, is the, na is the name changed to concern? 30 seconds. Okay. In the 30, se I'll exceed my 30 seconds to the lawyer if he will tell me. Uh, is, the, is the entire organization now simply called Concern, or just the independent dropped from here? And also, I would like to know if, this, if your DEIS contains any information for the ma many, many, many form letters in the files left by Diana Weir about who actually has already applied for this. There hasn't been a straight answer yet on this, but I'll be back. <laughs> Amount, this is the amount of paperwork that a member of the village goes through on this, a member of this town goes through on one application, and you people can't even be bothered to read it. <laughs> okay, um, next, uh, Ray D'Angelo. Is Ray still here? Ray D'Angelo? Okay. All right, those, that's the last card I have. Again, we're going to be adjourning this until on, uh, October 25th. It's a 6 p.m. meeting. <sighs> Do I have to go through the computer? Um, if somebody's on the computer, can the, I guess I, I technically it's a hybrid meeting, so we're going to have to ask, uh, is there anyone watching on the computer that cannot come back on October 25th. If so, click the raise hand icon and we will entertain your comment. <coughs> All right. All right. I'll make a motion to adjourn the public hearing to 6 p.m. on October 25th, right? Do we have a second? Second.
Second by Councilman McNamara. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> okay. Thank you. Those who those who are here for the uh, water quality hearing. Thank you for your patience and those who were here to speak at on the uh, concern for well, Liberty Gardens. The who are putting off your comments to the October 25th meeting. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Um, so, Jim, procedurally to go right, can we go right back? Yeah. Do I have to make a motion to reopen it or? I don't know. I think Sunday was yeah, saying we reopen you, the, uh, you re you continue it by vote. And I would suggest that you vote to reopen it. Okay, I'll make a motion to uh, reopen the hearing or continue. I guess it's basically to continue the hearing. This is un Conventional here yeah, second. on the water quality grants, uh, seconded by Councilman Martel. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so where were we? <laughs> we were still in the village of Southampton, right? We had, we had heard from wow. Dr. Gobler. We had sort of, I think, gotten through the first one on Lake Aguan. So, uh, what is Jackie? What's the second one? Old Town Pond Dredging. Mayor Warren, do you want to introduce us? I'll introduce this. We would like to make sure that uh, Charlie McGuckin and his team from Rue Engineers is, uh, is here for this. So hopefully they, uh, they're here and, um, and uh, available. If not, we might be able to move to another application, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay, perfect. So our second application here today is the Old Town Pond dredging project. Uh, it's best if we, uh, again, uh, turn this over to Charlie McGuckin. Uh, Old Town Pond is also uh, encapsulated as far as our village-wide water quality study <coughs> and also, as everyone knows, uh, suffers from uh, harmful algae blooms. Uh, <coughs> the uh, findings from the sediment sampling were very encouraging, uh, but I'll turn this over to Charlie and, uh, and his team there. Hi, I'm Charlie McGuckin with Rue Environmental Engineering, uh, working on behalf of the village of Southampton. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. we can, sir. Okay, uh, so uh, we've um, done a, a study of Old Town Pond um, to evaluate uh, water quality impacts. Um, the, the pond is about eight acres in size, uh, part of a fairly long, narrow, north to south watershed. Um, it, uh, it's groundwater fed um, and then has a manually controlled overflow out to the ocean. Uh, we've evaluated the, the sediment in the pond. Uh, it accumulates over time. Uh, it does take uh, both groundwater and stormwater uh, leaf litter. Uh, eventually, these types of freshwater ponds accumulate sediments uh, and they do need to be maintained. They, my understanding is the last time it was dredged was in the 70s, so it's been quite a long time. Um, we evaluated the pond because, uh, primarily because of the blue green algae impacts uh, come out, especially in the summer. Um, we, we investigated the volume of sediments in the pond. Um, we looked at the nitrogen and phosphorus levels, the fine sand, fine materials versus sands to understand it a little bit better. Um, and we've been able to quantify the, the volume of impacted sediments. Um, and what we've recommended uh, through this process is uh, remo removal of the bulk of the sediments that have accumulated. Uh, they are up to four feet thick towards the middle of the pond. Uh, they, they taper down to um, a few inches on the sides. Uh, this will remove a significant nitrogen and phosphorus source that uh, has degraded the water quality in the pond. Um, there's a resuspension of the nitrogen and phosphorus um, there's a uh, blue-green algae, as I mentioned. Um, there's a uh, reduced habitat, water quality, functionality of this pond to uh, address stormwater flows. Uh, so uh, the, the dredging will uh, complement 
uh, other proposed activities, including bioswales to address stormwater and, uh, and an interception of, uh, of groundwater with uh, natural treatment systems. Um, so what we've proposed is um, a dredging operation that will be, um, it, it, it's expensive, uh, $4.1 million in an estimate. Uh, it would take uh, all, all winter long, and then uh, the pro productivity of dredging will be hindered by the lack of available space surrounding the pond to, to stage material equipment and, and the, the dredged materials. So the exact amount of time will be subject to contractor evaluation. We did speak with two contractors who are knowledgeable to get some feedback on the practicality, costs, and, and the implementation factors. Um, but essentially, we would need every available space surrounding the, the pond to work in, a little bit of the park, a little bit of the beach parking lot. We'd need to take over uh, half of the road and make it a temporary one way just to try to give us enough space to, to function, to do the work. Uh, big cost is, is the disposal of the dredge materials. That's um, going to be the, the, the key factor here. Testing showed that about half of the material is actually clean by New York State DEC standards, so that could be reused. Half of it has impacts from likely from old um, fertilizers that were used in the area of grading, probably farming, and, and also just general road runoff. Um, so that would have to be disposed at a higher cost. Um, the, the, the work is, is um, time consuming because you're talking about uh, either mechanically or hydraulically dredging out the, water, the sediments through a five to eight feet of water thickness and then managing those sediments to water and getting them dry enough to get, get them out. Um, but the, the dredging, as I said, is something that does need to periodically be done. It, it's, um, it, it can't go on forever, uh, accumulating sediments like this and still function for water quality, habitat. And, um, and so this is, uh, this is the, the scope that we're, we're looking at um, and uh, our estimate to, to try to get it done. Has a location for dewatering of the dredge material been identified in the area? Uh, well, in talking with the, the village and uh, Gary Golesky of DPW, um, primarily we would be trying to manage the sediments and dewater the sediments uh, in the beach parking lot um, over the in the off season, and uh, as I said, to trying to take over the road shoulder and uh, a, a lane to try to manage, get, get a, a material in and out, and then at, within reason of not removing established trees, try to use the adjacent park to the north. Uh, the only other area in, in the immediate area is a, there is a village-owned um, gravel road that we could try to use to some extent, but it's pretty narrow in the area. So our, our, our Water Quality Board has made some recommendations, and I support this. Um, I think it's important, though, to note, and maybe you want to comment on it, that in conjunction with the, uh, the thing that we previously funded, the, uh, the wetland that we created, the artificial wetland, um, that these two things working together are pretty powerful. That's the message that I'm getting from, from our Water Quality Board. Could you comment on that? Yeah, sure. Um, and really, there's a third thing, which is the stormwater bioswales. And uh, so we've, uh, we agree uh, we want to intercept the uh, primary source of nitrogen from uh, both septic and, and, and old um, farmland <coughs> impacts from nitrogen. Uh, on on the, the positive side, the, the bulk of the load comes in um, on the, the northern side in a fairly channelized flow, which is helpful to try to capture. Uh, but we'd be intercepting the water as it comes in from the north and um, treating with a, a natural treatment system 
built into that southern end of that of the park. Uh, it would complement uh, a series of bioswales designed by Nelson and Pope. We've overlaid our proposed system with theirs so that they don't in interrupt each other and that they complement each other. And um, and then also, uh, uh, of course, uh, the equipment that would be required to do dredging would have to uh, be positioned and staged uh, so that depending on timing of things being built, there wouldn't be a, a damage to these new natural systems. But pretty much we'd be bringing the dredge material out the southern end um, and not interrupting the northern end where the, the park uh, and new systems are. So, but that would have to be coordinated. Um, so, but the, the only real available areas are some of the local beach parking areas really in the off-season. Thank you. Um, the, the pond is what, owned by the trustees? Yes. Yes. I believe, I believe yes. so, but I would, I would ask the... Not uh, the village trustees, but the town trustees. Right, right. I, I the, the town, yeah. Fantastic. I know two of them Bill, yeah. are, are here. Have they consented to this project since it's there on the waterlands? I've, uh, I've spoken to, uh, uh, to uh, Trustee Horowitz. I saw I saw Bill Pell on the street today, but um, didn't talk about the uh, the dredging. But but uh, um, try the the president is aware of it and, and supportive of it. Okay, um, and I see Trustee Welker's here as well. So this obviously would require their consent. So that would be a precondition of approval is that they're allowing the project. Um, and then, uh, do, what type of equipment are you using to dredge? Is it a uh, by crane or by pump or uh, we've, yeah, we, we've taken a look at both uh, hydraulic, which would be pumping and mechanical. Um, what would, would be most likely, although we would write a specification that would allow the contractor to choose their approach, but uh, hydraulic dredging was the one that was discussed, I would say, more um, to try to work you know, through the water and hydraulically dredge it out. It seemed feasible to do so, and um, just would have to have mechanical um, treatment systems to, to dewater the sludge, tanks and, and filter presses, that type of thing. And then at the end, is it being restocked with fish, or is there, what, what, what's living in that pond right now? I know I, I see some species along the roadside, there's some beavers, or. I'm not sure what they are, but as I bike past it, there's not these... Beavers. Not beavers. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> not beavers, but... You, you, they're, 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 are they gophers? Uh -huh. Muskrats. Yeah. Muskrats? Yeah, they don't have the big flat tails, but... It, 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 there is some... It's home uh, to something. <laughs> yeah, there's some life in the pond. I wouldn't call it a high water quality um, habitat uh, as it is, but this will certainly improve that habitat. I, I think that... Uh, there, there is uh, wetland and, and uh, decent habitat along certain locations along the pond. We wouldn't really be disturbing uh, the whole sort of western edge and, and minimal disturbance on the northern side. So it would be, be maintained as a habitat there, but the, the surface water quality would be improved very much. And, and also the depth that we'd be creating would provide a much better, uh, cooler, deeper water zone for uh, a better habitat for a larger fish population. Are there, are there, is there a fish population now? Uh, there, there is a minimal fish population. We didn't do a fish study, just kind of our observations. Um, but we didn't see anything large, uh, only small kind of So population. you're not suddenly going to get a fish population unless you stock it. So that's sort of my question is once the habitat is restored, um, are there going to be efforts to uh, rebuild any populations that might have once existed? Um, and will the dredging, you know, there's a lot of sedimentation, there's a lot of uh, sediment in the water. Does, was that going to affect organisms that are currently living there 
that might have to then get rebuilt. Yeah, um, during the dredging itself, there would be significant disturbance on the, uh, the habitat in the sediment itself um, that we would expect to uh, repopulate uh, naturally. Um, that isn't something that we included in terms of a plan uh, in our permit to DEC, which we have submitted, um, but we will talk to them about um, the, the need for, um, you know, in helping the habitat restoration. We, we would be doing uh, revegetation uh, to support the habitat restoration, but we usually don't do anything to the bottom sediments other than re re remove the, the sediments and let it naturally um, repopulate. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions? Uh, just one, Is there, has there been any history of, of dredging in this area at all or attempts to, to widen or deepen in the past? We, we just heard uh, that the, there was a dredging project that occurred in the, in the 70s, but not any, no specific information on how much or you know, what was done. Okay. Just that some maintenance dredging was done. All right, thank you. No questions. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, any other comments on the Old Town Pond dredging? The, the trustee, did you want to comment on this? I know you have another project you're here for at Sagaponic, but if there are any objections, it would be good for us to know at this juncture. I love that you guys like you straighten your tie up a little yeah. bit. <laughs> um, Bill Pell, one in Southampton Town Trustees. Our board would be entertaining this. We, I'm only one out of five, but myself, I would support it. I know other board members would support it. When we give out dredging permits, sometimes we do put coverings on it where they would have to restock it. This would be in a case where we would make them restock it with, you know, freshwater bass. Um, because they'll eat any kind of um, other fish what we don't want in there, what people throw in there. Um, maybe perch, okay, and whatever it's what, like someone like Dr. Gobler would suggest what we put in there. But, you know, and probably we, we would also probably most likely waive the fee of application and help get All along right. since we own the pond. Thank you, Trustee Pell. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, anyone else in the audience on this application for a grant for the village of Southampton for Old Town Pond dredging? All right, and uh, Charles, can we ask if there's anybody online who waiting to be heard on this application? They would have to click the raise hand icon. Okay, all right, so I, I think we're ready to move on to the next one. Jackie, what's the next one? It's another village application. Ag -Warm Lake Agwam Injection Well. Okay. Thank you very much. By the way, Jay, the only thing I would add on that prior application is I, I think Six. Councilman Bouvier brought up an excellent point, and thank you for making that. That's exactly what I was going to reiterate, that between this project, the constructed wetlands, which treats you know groundwater and surface water, as well as the bioswales, which we receive uh, county grant money for, uh, there's there's a three three uh, strong areas there. So thank you for bringing it up. I really appreciate. No, and that. that gets back to my earlier point that things that work together consecutively, I think it makes a lot more sense, particularly considering the size of some of the investments. So um, I appreciate your comment. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. So uh, I'll I'll turn this over uh, uh, shortly to uh, Dr. Gobler uh, regarding the Lake Ogham injection well. This is also uh, an extremely important project. Uh, thank you very much to the town board for funding uh, prior phases. Uh, we are very happy to be in, in position. I know Dr. Gobler uh, worked on, uh, on this grant, so I'll, I'll turn this over to him, but this is just another phase or tier of, uh, of our approach for uh, reduce, reducing uh, nitrogen and uh, phosphorus in Lake Agawam. Good afternoon. So this project builds on uh, a prior grant that I had applied for to New York State, um, and it actually builds on what was the Lake Agawam 
uh, harmful algal bloom management plan. So that management plan identified uh, nitrogen as one of the, the prime drivers. And so, and re as a reminder, that plan had sign on by the village, by the town, by the town trustees, and by the Lake Agawam Conservancy. Uh, and out of that plan, one of the, the first uh, objectives was to do a groundwater study along the north end of the lake. We did that study. I, I received a grant from New York State specifically to look at groundwater flow all across the north end of the lake. Um, worked with the consulting firm CDEM Smith and specifically engineer there Dan O'Rourke and uh, installed wells uh, to over 100 feet and sampling them every 10, every 10 feet. Um, and through the process identified in the northeast corner, uh, very uh, intense plume of nitrate uh, derived, well, nitrate, strong, high levels of nitrate in groundwater derived from Main Street flowing into Lake Agawam. In fact, Ron Paulson's here, and he actually participated in that project and uh, confirmed the flow of groundwater from that area into the lake. So um, Dan O'Rourke, looking at the depth of the nitrate, however, it's not right at the surface. So, you know, um, I believe it's uh, in the zone of, I think, 30 to 50 to 60 feet down. Um, and so, you know, a typical permeative barrier, you bring in a, a huge trenching system, uh, you'd start excavating earth, and you'd have to hold back the groundwater. Um, you know, that'd be incredibly invasive in, in, in this particular area. And so given the depth, the alternative approach that's been proposed here is called uh, an injection well uh, barrier. And so the idea is that there are products, they're EPA approved, essentially it's emulsified oil. Um, and the idea is to inject that into the groundwater. Uh, the emulsification of the oil assures that it does not move, uh, so it stays in place. By adding it, it reduces the oxygen levels to zero by stimulating microbial activity in the groundwater. Uh, and under an anoxic environment, that promotes uh, denitrifying bacteria and would denitrify the nitrate plume uh, in that particular area. Um, and it would do so over time, you know, as new groundwater would flow in, the nitrate in that groundwater would be, um, become anoxic and you'd have denitrification denitri uh, from that. Um, for this particular project, as I mentioned, um, I applied for it and got a $200,000 grant to do the preliminary study, and that would be considered matching funds. In addition, the Center for Clean Water Technology has committed to doing five years of monitoring for the program, uh, and that would be an additional over $100,000 of uh, matching funds as well, um, using our state funds from the, from the center. Um, so I think this is an, an exciting project. It's a, I, I will mention it's pilot scale, so it's not going to solve all the problems. Um, but I do think it's a good opportunity to, to try this new technology in this particular area uh, because it may well have uh, important applications elsewhere also. So the question is, where has it been done before successfully? So CDM Smith has done this in coastal ponds before, I think, uh, in specifically in New Jersey, and they've had success in uh, removing nitrate in that example. Okay. Because it's interesting, uh, you know, you reducing the amount of oxygen that's going into, the, into it, uh, but, you know, I always think of oxygen as being really important. <laughs> Right, yeah, except that's that, you know, once, once groundwater is oxygenated, the, the nitrogen will go nowhere. So that, and, and so this is really the same thing a permeable active barrier would do instead of, but in this case, the groundwater is running into the emulsified oil rather than, the, uh, than, than wood chips. Yeah, it's but it's, it's, it's just, just one different sort of forms of carbon. Yeah, this is very interesting. Be, I'd like to, if it's possible, could we get um, some information from C.D. Smith as to... Yeah, That's I have a I have a recent report That's I can great. send along for sure. Yeah, great, thank you. So you're deoxygenating the groundwater. Well, the bacteria will, yeah, right? So the the, the 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 essentially that that emulsified oil is a source of carbon, and so the bacteria need carbon to grow, and so they'll start breaking down that carbon, uh, and doing that they're going to just remove all the oxygen. Uh, so that creates the anoxic environment, which then allows the bacteria that are there to, that do denitrify, to start undergoing that process. So these wells are pulling water, I mean, it's not a solid wall, though, of these wells. They're no, it's going to be, actually, so it's, again, the idea, it's called injection wells. The idea is the emulsified oil is actually injected down into the groundwater and then spreads out, and, and so... Oh, it spreads out in the water in that area. Correct. It's and a lot then, less intrusive. And it's, tra that yeah. oil doesn't reach... 
It shouldn't. It should not reach the lake. There should, and it's specifically designed to not oh, move to too much. Yeah, and to break, and also it's it's being broken down by the uh, uh, by the bacteria. Typically, you know, oil spills and water bodies. Yeah, 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 things, yeah. So. Right, right. But this is spe again oh, specifically right. designed. It's EPA approved, um, and it's been used elsewhere. So you're basically creating this underground oil slick or so that the water is mixing with. Well, it doesn't really mix with oil, but pushes its way through. Well, and it's not petroleum the bacteria oil. Bacteria. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> the Vegetable. Thank you. Yeah. So the natural bacteria basically is using the carbon in the oil as the source. And in that metabolic process, it's pulling the nitrogen out. So it may be the same bacteria, or it could probably it will be even different bacteria. So there'll be one set that breaks down the carbon, uh, but denitrifiers only do that. Uh, they need it needs to occur in an anoxic environment. Um, so bacteria, by definition, that the first thing they want to do is use carbon and oxygen for their metabolism. In the absence of oxygen, the first thing they go after is nitrate as an energy source. And there's okay. six of these. Yes, all close together. And what yeah. is the above ground? I think there's just going to be a little bit of, um, uh, well, it, there, there should be, there's going to be a little bit of above ground structure for and able to access those wells and to. Um, so there'd be like six caps on them? Yeah. A, a well Are you injecting with the oil anaerobic bacteria? Is no, no. This just, just operates on, or? yep, the, uh, my favorite. Premise in microbial ecology, everything is everywhere and the environment selects. So the bacteria are already there, and if you create the right conditions, they'll come to prevalence and do their job. Um, so this is a, a lot less expensive to do than a, P, a normal PRB. It is a PRB in a way. Yes, right? in a way. But normally we think of a big trench with wood chips as right. your... Yeah, so but there's other there's other ways. Like, in fact, the collaborative project with Cornell, there's uh, the one that you funded in Hampton Bays, 100 foot barrier that had regular barriers, but also used these wood chip columns. So the idea of not in, in that case, you may not need to. Uh, and we've explored that in other cases where you don't necessarily need the trench. So you know, in some cases, you know, for like bulkheads, trenching is 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 ex you know it's getting done anyway. So why not? But in other cases, it that could be too uh, obstructive, and so having other sorts of options, you know, like this or like the columns, um, may be more appropriate. And there's no, I, mean, I guess, groundwater is not not going to rise up and push the oil up to the surface any way either. Not in a location like this. No. Yeah. So it's going to stay subsurface. Yep. And the oil will stay in place. My question is. Similar to that, supervisor. It's not supposed to migrate um, downstream from there. But the water will pass through Correct. the oil. Correct. But, but ultimately, a, it gets consumed. Yes. They're not miscible, so it's not actually passing through. So, but it's it's a little <laughs> oil and water don't mix. So, I, I think it's the way they prepare the oil. There's some the, the emulsified vegetable. I, I you know I could. <laughs> Uh, but like I said, it works. It's been done before. It works. <laughs> yeah. Come on, you're the scientist here. Yeah. So I, just, yeah. Um, I mean, we actually, that's used in, in offshore drilling as well. It's a process that's similar to that, not for the same reason. Yeah. But it controls the flow rates and controls the shape of the output. So, interesting. And would this require this to be a water quality piece too, or would it not matter that it's CPF park? It was your park again. It is. Um, that's an interesting question. Can this happen in Dozier Park? It's beneath Dozier Park. Um, yeah, we might want to be on the safe side if Dozier Park is becoming a water quality project site, and we're considering it for the uh, the filtration. I was just like, it, no, this, we might this well, was dependent on that. I th I think yeah, we probably but you have to be within to proximity to of, of the water body you're trying to measure. Correct. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the wells will need to be installed. And like I said, we, we did a lot of groundwater surveying and landed on a specific location yeah. given you know, identification of the plume it, in, in 3D. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you'll need electricity to the wells. Yeah. There'll be some above the surface structures. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Councilman McNamara raises a good point that this was a CPF project parcel, not a water quality 
CPF parcel, but a like Hamlet Park, and we'll probably have to deal with Albany on this project as well as the other, which may delay implementation. Again, okay. not insurmountable. Yeah. What, what size are the wells? Are they four inch casings or two inch? Do you know? I think they're two inch or so. They're injection wells. Yeah. They're not. Yeah. They they don't have uh, motors on them, or they don't require electricity. The wells are simply drilled, and then the substance is injected. And yes, but the injection does require, you know, a, right. Yeah, Once it's, it's an ongoing injection. Or is it a one-time injection? I think it's a it's a one-time and then you know potential follow-up. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, it depends how they set it up. Is there any danger of the of the oil getting into Agawam Lake? There should not be no. But if it and did? if it does, <laughs> if it did, right? It'll rise to the Would it be safe? Yeah, it's vegetable oil. Oh. So I don't and I don't I don't you know I I don't think that's a. Um, it's a realistic, realistic. I don't think there's any envir significant environmental risk. It's it's not a synthetic oil. It's an organic oil, and it'll decompose or it Right, and it's not. You know, again, it's the, the way it's designed, and the reason it's approved. That it's it's designed to stay in place to treat the groundwater there, and right? mm -hmm. so it's not meant to just flow out with the groundwater. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can understand why we. Have sure. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Injecting yeah. oil. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions? It's novel. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see the other data, the CD. Sure. Data. Okay. Let's. Uh, is there anyone who wanted to be heard on the Lake Aguam injection well grant request? <laughs> so none here. Um, online, Charles, anyone raising the, uh, or clicking the raise hand icon? I'm sorry. What'd you say? That's a no. Okay. All right, uh, let's move on to the last, I think this is the last village one? Okay. The it's the West Main Street uh, Bioswale. West Main Street Bioswale. Number 19, page 7. All right, Mayor Warren, it's all yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for letting us uh, consolidate our village applications, though I'm looking forward to hearing from the other applicants uh, regarding some other innovative water quality projects. Uh, the West Main Street Bioswell project, I don't know if we have Chick here, but I'll, I'll pass this to him. Uh, this is a project that has already been designed, permitted, and mostly funded uh, by, the, by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, the, uh, the town board and the, the committee should have the designs. Uh, we were uh, awarded uh, almost a $1 million grant from the New York State DEC for this project. Uh, this will result in a substantial reduction of, uh, of stormwater runoff into Lake Agawam, as well as the excavation of the parking lot uh, behind a village hall in, in Rite Aid. So if you're a village resident or a town resident that likes to use that parking lot, finally, uh, this parking lot will be excavated, repaired, uh, and also we'll be installing bioswales, trees, and other uh, natural species of plants that will not only um, help uh, reduce stormwater runoff into Lake Agawam, but also finally fix the parking lot. Uh, so uh, we're essentially asking the, uh, the town for a, a smaller portion of the, uh, the grant application, but hopefully if Chick is here, I'll, I'll turn this over to him and he could present further uh, some of the uh, research and engineering that was done behind this uh, bioswale. Charles, you know if Chick is, uh, Chick is on? Rusty, is rusty perfect. Hi there. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. it's, been, uh, it's been an interesting meeting. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for allowing me to present. Um, so the, the overall project is, as, uh, as uh, presented by the mayor, is that we're trying to improve uh, not only the parking lot situation, but more importantly, the water quality concerns that that parking lot of the existing parking lot is already ha um, already has, and so we are looking to um, uh, replace um, um, the islands on the ends where we don't have mature trees with rain gardens, replant new trees, put in um, uh, and bioswales with uh, uh, appropriate uh, bioswale plants. Um, we're really taking most of that water, the first inch and a half uh, of water into those 
systems before allowing it to go into the existing um, uh, catch basins. And then on the on the uh, far, uh, I'm looking at the map here. The far east or far west end, uh, right before you get to the bank, there is a large island there, and we're going to be doing a tree trench. It's a little bit more innovative, um, where the last of the water will hit that section. Um, provide an opportunity to do pretty much an underground rain garden with trees uh, so we that we capture that water and clean that water um, and yet have an opportunity for very large trees to grow and then uh, lastly we're going to minimize uh, any disturbance to the large existing trees that are uh, in the islands that are on the mature side and providing shade and water interception and a number of other aspects. Okay, thank you, Rusty. Any questions from the board? All right, no questions. Well, yeah. that's, that's right. easy. Yeah. <laughs> is there? A... It's, it's it's good and simple. Just so those yeah. so those giant trees in that center lane stay. Correct. Okay. Where where there's big where the large mature trees are, um, we're we're maintaining them. Where trees have died or um, have been replaced with little uh, saplings. Um, we are uh, putting in the bioswales. That's why the bioswales are kind of intermixed, not, you know, that whole length, they're uh, piecemeal along the, the whole corridor. Okay. Okay. Um, anyone from the public who wanted to weigh in on this project? Just, just this uh, bioswale project by the right Aid in Southampton Village, the parking lot to the rear of it. Uh, no one here online. Anyone online? Click the raise hand icon just for uh, commenting on this one particular project sponsored by the village. No hands. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So that's it for village projects, right, Mayor? That's right. We'll uh, we'll conclude uh, this afternoon. I wanted to thank the entire uh, town board uh, as well as the town clerk and everyone who helped out here. Uh, for their uh, their attention and uh, and time on these various projects, uh, the the thing that I'd like to mention in conclusion is that we came to this board here uh, asking for various studies uh, funding the overall water quality and watershed areas, both for Lake Aguam and for the entire village. Those studies are now done, and we are now finally actually uh, taking uh, those studies, and we are doing concrete or uh, actually not concrete, no point intended there, but we're, uh, we're, we're doing uh, uh, all these new, new green initiatives here uh, for water quality. And so I think this is, again, the result of, of years of, of studies and hard work. They're finally coming to fruition. I know that many applicants come and, and ask for studies like we did, but this is now the, uh, the action uh, associated with those studies. So I just wanted to thank you for funding those studies, and now we're looking forward to putting all those studies to work with, uh, with tangible projects that will have um, a short-term and long-term impact on our water quality. So thank you again to the town board for your time and attention. All right, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jackie, which, what's next? <laughs> All right, uh, I guess James Durier, uh, environmental analyst for the trustees, will be presenting this. This is the Sag Pond um, Restoration Project. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Supervisor of Town Council. Uh, Sagaponic Pond um, Aquatic Habitat Restoration, um, taking in nearly 180 acres. Sagaponic Pond is valued for its natural beauty and biodiversity of a wide variety of aquatic and terrestrial habitats. The region is recognized as significant coastal fish and wildlife habitat by both U.S. Fish and Wildlife and New York State Department of State. Sagapon Pond lies within the town of Southampton CPF high priority water quality improvement area. Sagaponic is under threat from a range of impacts including among others water quality de degradation, harmful algal blooms, historic loss of wetlands and natural, naturally vegetative buffers, shoreline erosion, inundation of farmland, road construction, and residential development. The effects of, <coughs> sorry, the effects of concern, uh, sediments, uh, nutrients, fertilizers, 
pesticides, septic effluent, and stormwater runoff are a particular concern, as these contaminants affect surface water quality, oxygen levels, algal blooms, the health of the wetlands, and natural habitats of biodiversity and recreational use. The Board of Trustees manage the tidal flushing of the Sagaponic Inlet, also known as Sagaponic Hut. The, the proposed the management of the inlet is to allow the pond to drain to restore water levels uh, close to mean tide levels and ocean to the flush pond water of contaminants and pathogens to increase dissolved oxygen levels and to increase salinity to create brackish conditions favored by shellfish, uh, certain wetland vegetation, and wetland dependent wildlife species. Project for approval is for creation of water quality improvement plan to incorporate uh, environmental and human health risks at Sagaponic Pond, working towards a sustainable plan for re remediation, okay. tidal flushing to increase water quality, to maintain, uh, manage buffers, to increase native vegetation, and to promote filtering uh, excess nutrients before they enter Sagaponic Pond. This will include planning, design, construction, revitalization activities intended to improve the water of uh, Sagaponic Pond, uh, to support habitat restoration for fish and wildlife by incorporating all the issues, including not limited to water quality, hydro hydrology threats, um, management issues, HABs, HABs, uh, swimming closures, agricultural lands, roads, water quality management practices, real-time measurements, upland buffer installation recommendations, aquatic habitat, watershed restoration initiatives, tidal inlet openings, endangered species history, potential permeable right reactive barriers, and methods practices that improve to overall water quality of Sagaponic Pond. Um, water quality studies, I'm sorry, Sagaponic Water Quality Improvement Plan. The trustees are seeking to sync with the inlet management funding uh, with the 10-year New York State DEC permits they've received. Um, we are continuing this as you guys have uh, funded for two years uh, in the past, so it's a continuation. Um, I'm joined here with Trustee Ann Welker, as well as Trustee uh, Secretary Treasurer Bill Pell. Um, as well as um, Chris Gobler, uh, Dr. Chris Gobler at uh, Stony Brook University. So if you have any questions, I believe Chris and Ann have. Uh, so this is to similar to what you guys requested for Meacox. Correct. Uh, the, the difference is that uh, Meacox already had a management plan. Uh, this is also uh, for Sagaponics incorporating a managing plan, so building that plan and doing the studies to. So it's the creation of the plan plus the execution of the plan over a five-year period? Correct. And that execution of the plan includes the opening and closing of the Correct. cut, which we've already been funding. Correct. Correct. Um, okay. Does it also include those buoys with the monitoring stations and things like that, the water quality monitoring? Yes. And yeah, I could hear from Dr. Gover a little bit yeah, on it. Yes, I think that's included. Um, and it's it's five years worth of funding, correct? That you're asking for, so it's roughly what 124 or something thousand a year. I believe so. Yeah, it should be in there. Okay. Well, that's the recommended funding by the. Committee. Well, that's funding one year. The request they is different. Oh, the request yes. The request the, is five oh, yeah. times that. Right. Um, okay. Any other questions for Mr. Durier? All right. Um, did you want to weigh in on this, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wants you to go first. Uh, I mean, one one uh, tangible outcome of this whole project is we do have a water quality monitoring buoy in Sag Pond, and just as a reminder, this system is vulnerable to harmful algal blooms, so specifically toxic blue green algae, and so. A, a very positive outcome is that, that now the trustees via this buoy can actually see in real time the occurrence, how the blue algae blooms are developing, and have used it over the, I mean, and can confirm this, but are now using it now that we started this to manage the opening of the cut. And so, you know, the blue, 
and in, I think in a perfect world, you know, the, 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 maybe the cut is closed during the summer, so everybody who's on the, the uh, pond could enjoy high water level. But at the same time, what, what has happened uh, during the last several summers is that during uh, midsummer, late summer, these blooms start developing. Uh, and actually, opening that cut flushes them right out, and it's been uh, a great way to mitigate those blooms. So that's been a tangible outcome of the, the uh, prior project, and we'll obviously continue, continue to do that. Another outcome of the prior, prior project was partly also collaborative with the Peconic Land Trust, was, but was looking at total nitrogen loading to Sagaponic Pond, and then identifying what the most important sources were. Um, and through that, we identified that more than a quarter of the nitrogen load is coming in from wastewater. Uh, and that's also had some good knock-on effects. There's now a, a project that's starting between the Peconic Land Trust and uh, the Center for Clean Water Technology to help the community around Sag Pond to begin upgrade septic systems. Um, and so, you know, there's already feasible management outcomes from the last project, and I think taking all the data together to put together a comprehensive plan will then align the other pieces that need to get done. Uh, and I think, again, we have people from Cornell here who have been uh, doing groundwater uh, investigations there, and that, that also will be part of the management plan as well. So I think, you know, the, the, the first, the, the outcomes out of the first, you know, funding of this have been very significant, and it's, I think that the whole, that whole system that has been in trouble. I remember the first time I got a call a decade ago, someone saying, you better get down to Sag Pond. The pond's incredibly green, and the levels of blue ground are incredibly high, and, and actually high levels of toxins as well. So, uh, and nobody knew what it was and what to do. I think, you know, we're very far away from that now, thankfully, and I think on a path to uh, begin remediating that pond. And, and most importantly, in the, already protecting public health by managing the, uh, uh, the cut. So, um, Can I ask a sort of, I guess, related question? So uh, we, we have a permit, I guess a five-year permit from the DC, like we have with Mecox to open it. Um, it just seems like those cuts are being managed, basically the, the water level rises up and then the cut is open and the water pushes out and as you say, the blue-green algae flushes out. But for that water body to be healthy, it also requires that the water come in it can't be just a one-way thing because you it's a brackish water body it's not a fresh right, I mean it becomes it becomes tidal in most cases when when the cut and again I the trustee should comment as well but I think when the cut is done properly as per as is the case in Mecox when it's done properly it's open and it does become tidal and you do get that uh, two-way flushing and at least in the southern end of the pond you can see salinities that actually um, you know, are not far off from ocean salinities, but, of, you know, with the gradient getting towards brackish as you move up the, uh, the neck of the system. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Dr. Goldberg? Well, just quickly, that mix with the phosphorus and nitrogen issues with the salt water, and, you know, we're always pushing homeowners around freshwater bodies to use phosphorus mitigating IA systems. Um, how does that impact this with this kind of mix? I'm just curious because we're sorry, I think we're struggling a little bit as to we don't have the the right IA system to to do that um, for phosphorus. You're saying yeah. So I think in this particular case, the sediments themselves are probably a stronger source of phosphorus than the IA systems. Th that being said, just as an aside, that the Center for Clean Water Technology just is starting a new initiative with the state to address phosphorus and wastewater as well and to find out ways of reducing that with potentially just simple add-ons that would go to existing systems uh, and maybe even uh, the ability to recover that phosphorus but uh, yeah because i think we only have one ia system that there's an add-on for phosphorus remediation correct but is that really i mean you've said in the past that the nitrogen is like 70 percent from residential waste or something like that and the rest from, you know, fertilizers, pesticides, whatever. It, but where, but with phosphorus, it's got to be a much larger component from, you know, agrochemicals or from, you know, from well, fertilizers. It's a legacy product. It, I mean, it, firstly, it's totally dependent on the system, right? And so, but it, in a lot of freshwater systems, the sediment becomes the strongest source because there's no volatile phase. But where did the phosphorus. phosphorus get there to begin with? It's right. Well, ultimately, it may have come from from fertilizer, right? But but recognize it's been accumulating for you know right. decades, centuries. I'm just saying that the IA systems. It's fine to try to look at different technologies, but the main source 
unlike nitrogen, it may be predominantly from uh, fertilizers. Yeah, I mean, we ha and we have some of that data. And Lawn so, and uh, farm. Yeah. It, it, it varies. I mean, in the legacy areas, yeah, it's a big component of it. But I was actually speaking to the systems that actually can mitigate that from, from the IA system. Right. But also, that same technology that's, that's applied to a runoff systems and management systems as part of that, too. Uh, that's being explored. So, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I keep thinking about Mill Pond all the time, you know, and with... Um, you know, with all the troubles we've had and the amount of phosphorus sitting on the bottom there with, and, you know, sequestered in little Australian <laughs> crystals or yeah. whatever they yeah. might be. But it's a problem, and I'm Fos not Lock. sure how to mitigate it, you know. The Foslock. Well, I was trying not to yeah. say Foslock, but. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, thank you, thank Chris. You. Yeah. Appreciate it. Trustee Walker. Good afternoon, Supervisor Schneiderman. Town board members, thank you, Dr. Gobler, so much, and James Durier for your time here today. Um, I'd like to just address what you're referencing. The trustees are the beneficiaries of everything that's done on our uplands. So the the any septic system that's upgraded, any property that reduces their use of their pesticides, their fertilizers, their irrigation is beneficial for our water bodies. Sag Pond is a jewel. It's one of several coastal ponds, Meacox, Georgica, Sag Pond. The three ponds historically were opened one after the other in the fall and in the spring to allow the migration of fish and crabs and so forth to take place. Now perhaps we've changed and we have different stressors that are prevalent in the pond and we open for different reasons, but there's still benefits to the opening of the pond. To address your question, Supervisor Schneiderman, as to the title exchange, the 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 level of sag pond the bottom the bottom of the, the of the pond is higher than the than the ocean level so we get a really good drain there when we open i'm not explaining this perhaps as well as i might but we also get a really good flush and that's partly because the distance from the ocean to the pond is much shorter than you've experienced at Meacox. Meacox, it's hundreds of yards probably back to the bay sag pond is very short sag pond opens itself easily, multiple times, sometimes in a year, on high storm or, or new moon or full moon tides. It's usually on storm tides. But what we're looking at here is the benefits of opening it when there are public health emergencies, such as harmful algal blooms that take place in a highly used recreational water body. Pad um, paddle boarders, kayakers, sailors, canoers, crabbers, fishermen use Sag Pond. The opening of the pond takes the salinity level with the inflow of the tide, takes the salinity level and mitigates that those harmful algal blooms. So it's so important for us to not only have this the opening of the pond, but also to have the funding for the opening of the pond tied to our permit. Our permit runs for, in Sag Pond runs for 10 years and it will expire, I believe in 2026. So we still have several years left on it. So we're hoping that you'll look to the long term, the long game for the funding for this pond. Thank you so much for your time. Have a good <coughs> afternoon. Thanks, Thank Dan. you, Trustee. <coughs> Just any like other to thank questions? you. Do you have any questions? Do you have all of your permits in place besides the New York State DEC? Yes. Army Corps of Engineers? I yes. Okay. U.S. Fish and Wildlife? Yep. <coughs> Southampton Town Trustees? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, we do. 
Okay. Um, anybody from the public on this uh, SAG Pond request? All right, seeing none. Uh, Charles, do we have anybody online with the raised hand no, icon? Sir. No? Okay. Um, all right, I think we can move on to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Thanks, thank you. guys. Jackie, what's the next one? Uh, Rain Gardens at Emma Park. Okay. This is a town one, right? From Parks. Okay. Um. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Supervisor and Council people. Um, this project is part of a larger project that we're doing um, at the M. Elliston Park. Uh, we're redoing the uh, retaining walls and new staircases there. Uh, we're also asking for some CDBG funding, uh, which is going to help to bring some uh, handicapped improvements there as well. Um, so basically, um, this project is to install a series of rain gardens uh, that will be built from the north end of the, um, the parking area and then basically making their way down to the, um, the lake itself, the, the pond, Big Fresh Pond. Um, we're seeking $46,500. Uh, the majority of that funding will be to um, create excavation of like a bioswale areas. There's going to be uh, four of them right now. We'll also be using some uh, rock riprap and impoundments to keep those uh, secured so they don't wash out. Um, it's evident now that there's lots of washout that comes down the slope there. There's approximately an 80 foot drop from where the parking lot area is to the uh, level of the water. Um, if you look, if you go there, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the area. Um, on the western side of where the retaining wall area is, there's lots of washout that literally just makes its way down to the pond. Um, and so we're hoping to prevent that from happening in the future. And uh, we'll hopefully keep some runoff coming from Mill, uh, Millstone Brook Road and the parking area. Um, also, I would like to note that uh, Big Fresh Pond is uh, listed as an impaired waterway, a 303D impaired waterway um, under the Water Quality Improvements Plan, uh, Projects Plan. So, um, yeah, I mean, basically that's it. We'll install some native plantings to secure these impoundments that we're creating, these bioswales. Um, and uh, there'll be, you know, native, there'll be some flowering plants there, and we're hoping if we plan it right, we can make it so that the, you know, the, it's kind of an attractive look when you come to the park also, because we know there's lots of recreational use there, um, so. Any questions for Doug? Yeah, is one of the goals to stabilize the shoreline? Uh, yes. On this washout, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with the walls and with the, you know, with these impoundments that we're creating, yes, we're definitely looking to obviously stabilize the, you know, the shoreline and make sh make it so that there's no more, you know, runoff and sediment making their way into the, into the lake there. Okay. Other questions for Darrell? No match, huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, no, actually, we are, um, like I had said, we are doing, this is a multifaceted project, so um, the town has committed um, uh, money in the capital plan to put toward the walls and the staircases, um, and we're also pursuing the CDBG grant, which will um, help us with our ADA improvements. We're hoping to create like a viewing area, um, kind of where the washout happens now. So we'll stop the washout, and then we'll create like a kind of a handicapped access path that'll go down and there'll be like a viewing area so anybody who's in a wheelchair or you know walker or whatever they'll be able to make it down there without having to use the staircases to get to the uh, to the water level thank you good thank you the overall, overall project has a large safety value to it yes yeah the walls um in the pictures here you'll see they're in really really bad shape um so we've actually already got a new york state dc permit to restore those walls and staircases um, and we have a contractor on board that's doing a suffolk county um, requirements contract so we'll be able to um, pull the pull the trigger on this project hopefully in the next couple of weeks um, and then obviously the water and quality um, portion of it will happen once we are if we do get the grant you know we'll be able to implement those later on. I don't know if uh, the timing will be there to do plant installations this year. We'll probably have to do those in the spring because it'll just make more sense to, you know, put in those native plants in the rain garden areas. Great. All right. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Thank you very much. Anyone from the public on this uh, Elliston Park rain garden project? All right, Charles. Anyone watching? 
uh, on their computer indicating they wish to be heard on this okay. project. Okay, um, Jackie, do we still have one more? Or? Yes, the last one is talked about on groundwater seepage and nutrient input. <laughs> okay. 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 Page 17, number 18. Thank you for your patience. All right. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for having us today. My name is Molly Graffham from Cornell Cooperative Extension. I'm with Ron Paulson and Josh Halsey from the Conic Land Trust. Uh, we are here to talk about our non-point source nutrient abatement in Paxabon Pond project. Uh, as you may be aware, there's water quality impairments and algae blooms obser observed in Paxabog Pond. This pond is about a mile north of Sagaponic Pond that we've just been talking about. And residential septic systems in the area are antiquated and uh, groundwater derived nitrogen is likely a large contributor to nutrient issues in the pond. It's within the Long Island Greenbelt, which is a New York State significant coastal fish and wildlife habitat and home to globally rare species. Based on modeling output from the Suffolk County Subwatershed Wastewater Plan, it has indicated that there's groundwater drive in the pond, and so we are um, we are expecting groundwater in input to be influencing the pond, but our uh, work is going to be specifically locating the areas where high nitrogen um, and high flow rates are happening in the pond. We gave a presentation to the trustees a few months ago to um, present our, our project, and we received approval from them to use our equipment to move forward with this project. And we submitted a proposal to the CPF committee for a multi-phase approach for measuring and quantifying nutrient inputs. And then in phase two, characterizing the shoreline and in f future phases, remediating the groundwater nutrient inputs. Phase one is currently being funded through the Peconic Land Trust through privately funded donations. And we've began that study. We've started collecting data at the pond collecting pore water from within the sediments and surface water samples, and then we have a, um, some groundwater wells going in soon. Our work is gonna continue in the spring, so we get data when the water table is at a higher level. Right now, the water table is very low because of the lack of rain. And in phase one, we'll be identifying and prioritizing shoreline areas according to groundwater nutrient loading, and then we are requesting $39,936 in CPF funds to execute phase two, which is the site characterization for remediation. The deliverables for phase two would include a site characterization report, which outlines the targeted areas for remediation and the anticipated pounds of nitrogen removed, as well as site-specific data for remediation design and recomm recommendations on the remediation approach. One of the most promising methods for nitrogen remediation, which we've been talking about in this meeting already, are permeable reactive barriers. We would provide recommendations on another type, um, such as nutrient bioextraction or habitat restoration, if we find that the conditions wouldn't be suitable for PRBs. But they are a very um, promising technique in the area. And it's um, PRBs, I think you're familiar with them. So we've been discussing them, but they are a form of passive nitrogen removal, relying on natural microbes that exist in the soil to convert nitrate to nitrogen gas, which is completely harmless. And they provide immediate water quality relief. So we have some residents in the area who've expressed support for this uh, study. And just in general, the community members have been really um, well receiving of this project and looking to help improve the pond in any way that we any way that they can so we know that there's local support and we also know that the town owns land around Poxbug Pond as well as the county and then private residents so uh, we think this project is really feasible and it builds on the work that we've already been doing in Sagaponic Pond which is which has partially been CPF funded and privately funded We've been doing similar work in Hampton Bays and also in East Hampton. We actually have an injection PRB that is going in in East Hampton this fall. So um, the project that Chris Gober was mentioning was the one that's going in in Agawam. We, we also have one going in in East Hampton that will help improve Three Mile Harbor. So that's also a pilot project and we'll start to understand the different dynamics of this, this new type of PRB. We'll be taking soil samples to see how fast that carbon potentially degrades. So that will provide some key information and, and move PRB use forward in like a less intrusive way. 
So just to summarize, we've had some success in several of the towns and we've been leveraging private money with the CPF money and we hope to continue to do that. And the projects have been well received in these communities and we um, are excited about the water quality improvements that we will be measuring over time as these projects are implemented. Thank and you. And a 50% match, private match, you said? Yes, 50% private match through the land trust private donations. All right, any, any questions? No. How you doing, Ron? You know, again. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I just want to emphasize that injection. Ron, just speak, uh, just speak into the microphone. You know, that the injection region. project has been, a, it was a, with East Hampton Town at WQIP. It's been going on for three or four years, too. And we're really excited because we're actually installing the wells, you know, this month and then we'll do the injection in October. So I think it's a good complement to what uh, they're proposing in Lake Agawam because I think having multiple sites and multiple ways to test and do, because it's a technology that you can do less intrusively. You know, you can use a geoprobe and injection system and go in backyards, you can go. So we're excited about that. We're excited about being able to auger in columns of wood chips without trenching, without dewatering, and there's hybrid ones we're developing. So it's really kind of cool, it's cutting edge, and uh, you know, we're happy to have these sites and support, so. Great, thanks. Sounds like it's potentially a lot less expensive to do yeah. than a standard PRB as well. Yeah, and a lot less intrusive. Yeah. yeah, all of our effort is kind of geared towards making these more viable, more cost effective, more efficient. All right, thank you. All right. Thank uh, thanks. Josh, you didn't want to say anything, did you? Uh, I don't have any questions. All right. Uh, How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Do, uh, is there anyone from the public who wishes to be heard on this last of the water quality projects? Okay. Um, and Charles, anyone online? Is anybody looking to be heard on this last project? No, sir. Okay. Um, so it sounds we don't need to hold this over in any way. I think we're able to close this track. You didn't need, uh, Stephanie, do you want to go on record with anything? I mean, you've been sitting here the whole time. You, no, but we have all your memos. We have everything, so. I think, I think you have everything. I mean, if there's any specific questions, feel free to. I just, I, I just want to say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you put in so much time. All of you. And you, you guys these, and not that we always agree with you, but you know we always <laughs> consider everything you say very carefully. Agree. And uh, you have, I mean, I, I love the way you approach these issues from a technical standpoint and from a practical standpoint and um, think about all the various considerations, um, whether it's, uh, you know, matched funding or, uh, you know, complications that could arise. So uh, we're really, we're really blessed to have you chairing this committee, and I just want to thank you and the whole committee for all the time that you put in. Um, this is sort of, it's new. We only have this, we've only had the water quality grant money uh, for a couple years now. It's a significant source of funding, and we want to make sure it's well spent, it's targeted, and we get the best bang for the buck. And um, we're doing some innovative things, and uh, hopefully, um, our bays and harbors uh, will reap the benefits. Yeah. I, I have to say that uh, I very much appreciate the, the efforts of, of all of the committee members in... in, in well, you know, Stephanie, I'm going to ask, just because <laughs> I know what no you're going to say is, is important, and we won't get it in the recording. And I also want to prevent Charlie from running out here saying, you got to go to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> we get that in landmarks too. So. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank um, all the committee members for, for all the work that they've done. I mean, we, we've each trolled through all of these applications. We've hashed them out in multiple meetings. We've gone back to the applicants in some cases and asked for additional information. And I also appreciate you know, the support of land management in, in what we've done. We could not do it without them. Um, and we very much would appreciate that continuing support as we move, you know, forward in, in successive years. I mean, we've, we've been 
Um, you know, it's been an increasing workload each year because we've had more and more applicants. I think people are getting more used to how to put these applications together. They're, they're getting very innovative with some of the projects that we've seen, and we've been very excited about, about many of the projects that we've seen, uh, particularly this last year. We've gotten, we're getting very, I would say, mature applicants. Uh, who you know who know how to present their information and they know they know in many cases what we're going to ask and look for so it's a uh, it's a good it's a great program and I, I look forward to its continuing well I, you know we look when forward we, to your continuing <laughs> <laughs> when, when we up. first started this you know we it was it was we sat around and what can we do and I think the key to requirement and I know I pushed really hard was to create this the your water quality committee and it's not just the enthusiasm of the committee members, but it's the skills behind it. And the fact that they're unencumbered from outside influences and all sorts of other reasons, that we really wanted to make that an independent body, and it seems to be working really well. And we'd like to continue that and, and, yep. and see the innovation that comes out. It's really, really extraordinary to see this. So uh, thank you guys all for all your work that you're doing. And uh, right. Just maybe we could have these like maybe four at a time as opposed yeah. to ten. Yeah. Uh, and then how many public hearings will that be? <laughs> uh, whatever, it, whatever it takes. All right. So we, we do need to move along. So okay. um, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to make a motion to close uh, public hearing number four. Second. Seconded by Councilman Bouvier. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and we, we did all receive a notice of public hearing to we, the thing we dealt with earlier about that potentially historic property, but I'm going to let's wait on it. Let's get to public portion. I don't uh, the public has waited long enough. It's we this is uh, three hours in and then I'll make a, a motion to walk on that resolution. Okay, so and I don't know if Ray is still here. It doesn't look like it, but uh, there may be some people at home. So Gail, you've been waiting and As I've said in the past, I slept down here. I want my money's worth. And, and also, I do appreciate some accommodation. I try to write big notes, but I can't always follow them. Um, Take your time. So my partner said I sounded very angry at the public forum, but some of that is because I do try to rush through. And also, you know, I, I was a name party in that um, attempt to neutralize the community. And I, I am very upset and very offended. And I, I do want to say that I know that you apologize, but I think the apology is really just that um, a standard operating procedure was exposed. Um, it's not that, that it's not the standard operating procedure to try to neutralize people. And, it, it, you know, tone is from the top, Jay. I mean, you know, fish rots from the head. So for you, people in the planning department or people in the community, community leaders, your appointed CAC chair or your you go, you go to people, the civic, they wouldn't feel empowered to treat people the way they have in the six years that I've been here. And if you guys remember, just a couple of weeks earlier, I came to you and said, the reason I started on this journey, the reason I got on my soapbox of righteousness for six years was because I attended two meetings with my neighbor six years ago with the civic and your administration, and she was, our new favorite word, neutralized. Two meetings in a row. And I thought I'd come to this board, and especially John Bouvier and Tommy John, and at that time Julie, who were in my house just weeks earlier, supporting Julie's campaign. I thought this was going to be an anomaly. This isn't what happens here. And then it turned out to be standard operating procedure. And because I came here to question, you know, what's going on with the park, my neighbor's concern, my neighbors on Squire Town Road are concerned, I got labeled as some park hater. I never hated the park. My questions were never answered. Where's the money? Where's the espionage? Where are the bathrooms? All these things were never answered or answered to my satisfaction. And as an auditor, that's a red flag. Somebody can't look me in the eye. How funny is that? But if somebody can't look me in the eye and tell me exactly what's going on, that's a red flag. But I'd like to really put this ugly, horrible chapter behind us. And I'm genuinely sincere about that. Um, I don't hold grudges. I'm Italian, but I don't hold grudges. So, but I want to move forward. And again, I don't quite believe the fact that you want to start off fresh. I, I, it's hard for me to believe, it really is. So now you need to kind of prove it to the public, prove it to me. So I've sent you an email, you know, I sent you an email where I feel is the necessary steps. 
And so, just let me find my notes. Yikes. Um, all right. The first thing is I really think you should take an affirmative action. I didn't find my notes yet. I'm doing this off the cuff. Um, to what they call withdraw the appeal. I mean, you have an appeal in play. It's in your court. Um, you could let it die on the vine, but I think it's an easy process to withdraw it. And I think by withdrawing it, you're sending a statement to the community that you don't want to appeal it, that you realize that the, an old HBDOD is not necessarily what the community wanted. And so I think it would send a clear message to the community to do that. Um, okay, I found my notes. All right, two, I think you need to abandon the site for the um, sewage treatment plant. I think it's clear people don't want that site for lots of different reasons, technical reasons, emotional reasons. Find a new site. Um, three, um, you need to really remove all your co-conspirators from the process. Anybody that has demonstrated that they're willing to take those kind of actions, and there are enough of them, they need to be removed from the process. Um, four, I think you need to appoint uh, Supervisor Snyderman. You said you're in no rush to get somebody new. I think you should be in a rush to get somebody new. I think we need some, uh, an appointed consultant or a, a, a facilitator that's going to run a fair and transparent process um, moving forward. Um, and the number five is conduct those uh, public um, uh, input in the public forum like this where it's recorded, where it's part of the public record, not where it's ad hoc. And Cindy, I understand like you posted on Facebook that people came up to you and had some good suggestions after the meeting. I'm not on Facebook. I, I don't participate in that social media. But you know, when we were here for the Bel Air, um, there was, I don't know, a handful, a dozen of us that came I posted to Bel Air. And Julie Lofsted said, well, you know, I get my information from the produce section at Ken Cullen. Well, we didn't know we had public hearings there. You know, so I expect that, I know you have personal lives and personal opinions and the council people are part-time jobs, but I do really feel that, you know, you need to so set yourselves to a higher standard and we need to have a formal, you know, community participation process where you could, a real process, not with those, you know, predetermined answers and surveys and, you know, we, um, Okay, and the false narratives. You really need to start with the false narratives. I can't speak to, and again, I'm going off of your quote, Supervisor Snyderman, that um, Hampton Bays was a ghost town. I think that was your term or whatever, on Labor Day weekend. So I wasn't out Labor Day weekend on Main Street in Hampton Bays, nor was I in Southampton. But the thing is, 65% of businesses fail in the first 10 years, so the HBDOD is not a panacea for fixing a small business problem. Um, the other thing is the 248 apartments. That is not the maximum amount. That is an estimated amount in a 10-year theoretical build-out, including in that 10-year theoretical build-out, was 100,000 square foot facility for an assisted living. So that doesn't exist because the use didn't exist. So the issue is, one, where does that go? Two, this is form-based code. So for every little box, a, a developer is going to say, well, where am I going to make the most money? And he may choose an apartment over you know a retail store and then three they could go whining to the zoning board of appeals in the planning department and get rubber stamped wherever they want anyway so we don't know i mean i'm going to say it could be thousands but yeah it could be a thousand it could easily be a thousand on full build out at maximum we don't know what that number is and we shouldn't allow that you know i'm not a big fan of form based code it but you know that's just me that the developers you alec you delegated that to the developers but that's a you know, discussion for a different day. Um, what else? I think that, I think, is that it? And this is kind of like a little harsh, maybe, but I, I really do feel like we lost, you guys lost your way, really, as an administration, and this is town board, including the newer members of the town board, where you forgot who you represented. I really feel like you feel like, you, again, you say the developers, you know, will make developers profit. I'm not opposed to profit. I, developers should make money, but that should not be the focus of what you do for the community and that you're stewards of our environment. It, it's, it's somehow it's gotten lost in the noise. You're the stewards of our environment for the future. I don't have children, I, so I'm not going to have grandchildren, obviously. 
So but what about the future? I mean, like I said, go back to what I said. Rick says, all these people moved out here. What about our traffic, our noise, our pollution, our water usage? You know, and what um, Francis said, all these projects are done in a vacuum, whether it's the legal um, violation of CEQA, in the, as in the case of the HBDOD, that it wasn't part of a plan, or just the spirit of CEQA, that, okay, we know these 10 things are going on. Is it legally in violation of CEQA? Maybe not. But you as stewards of our environment should say, hey, guys, you know what? We need to take a step back. We need to make sure that we don't have this life, but we're all sinking. So I'm really hoping, like I said, I don't hold grudges. It, it's too, my life is too complicated to do that. 30 seconds. Thank you. I, wow, I made the three minutes? No, yeah. you didn't. No, no, but I actually <laughs> stayed within the three minutes. I thought I was going to go way over. So, okay, okay. So, you know, I really hope that we can move forward in a positive way. I started six years ago. I'm here to help. I have a lot of skills. I don't have vision, but I have a lot of skills. I'll put them out there to help you guys navigate through it. I don't want to be your adversary, I, but you put your, your foot on my neck. And so I'm hoping, I really am hoping, this is a fresh start, this was a watershed moment that we could all move forward. And that's all I have to say. All right, see you guys soon. Okay, is anyone else who wishes to be heard in public portion? All right, Charles, uh, online, do we have anybody indicating they wish to be heard at public portion? No, sir. Okay. Um, I will make a motion to close public portion. Second. Seconded by Councilwoman McNamara. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, we have been sitting in these chairs for one, two, three, four and a half hours. You guys want five minutes? Yes. Yes. Stretch, sir. and then we will resume with the. Uh, oh, before actually, before Sorry. we do the rest, let's walk add to the. Let's walk do the one walk on. Let's do this, and then we will take a five-minute. We didn't do that one, but he'll get to. I'm sorry, Jackie? I uh, was just wondering if we can change the hearing. The, the walk-on one? Yeah. Um, well, we're about to discuss it, so I guess we, we haven't walked it on. I could walk it on with slightly changed. There's no changes. Between Otherwise, I have to walk it on and amend it. So yeah, just, just added historic preservation. Okay. That's, that's what I have. have. Yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's what we're doing, yeah. yes. All right, so let me make a motion to walk on 41295. What it is, we talked about this earlier in the day. It, it just basically, as we consider the property in Flanders that has some buildings that may be historic, we had it, we held a hearing today for open space acquisition. We should, in the hearing notice, also include the words uh, uh, historic preservation as well. So um, this resolution would allow us then, since we've already adjourned the other one till October 25th, is that the date? No, no September, I'm sorry, no, September, September. September 27th, this would tie in by um, noticing a hearing for that date. And Jim, then the other one, it becomes a brand new hearing, right? Right. It's a separate hearing Second. notice. So the other one we could then close and then we could consider this one too. Charles, you need me? Um, that's okay. All right. So, um, so what this does is a hearing. It sets a hearing for September 27th at 6 p.m. on uh, 1040 Flanders Road for uh, open space and historic preservation. So it would be the uh, we'd be adding the uh, historic preservation target area to it. You all have a copy of it. So this is just a motion to walk this on to our agenda. Second. Second, uh, Council Min Martel. This requires four out of five. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that is now part of our agenda. We'll take that up at the end. And um, we're going to recess for five minutes and then we will reconvene. Um, I'll make a motion to recess. Second. Seconded by Councilman Bouvier. All in favor? Aye. 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 Charles may have to keep it running, right? Just let them keep it running. Yeah. Put across.
did the motion. I think.